Wow. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Oh, can you hear me? There you go. Yep, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, you're all right, Jeff. How's it going? Can you see me? Okay, do you want me to turn another light on? Or do you... I'll turn another no, light on. I'm, you're good. You're good. Am I good, am I? I can't turn, yeah. another, I can't turn another light on. Just, um, that's pretty better. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. nice to talk to you, man. Yeah, nice to actually, yeah. I mean, it's good because I thought I'd bring you anyway before anyway. So it's, um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. You have to introduce yourself anyway. Um, Say um say a few things about yourself, you know. Um, Plug this up here. Boom. Okay. We should be good to go. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. So um so so so, so uh, yeah. So how you you worked on Blue Velvet? So um. Yeah. What, what yeah. Your... I've, I've had a I've had a good run. I, I've I'm one of the weird ones in a way. I I always knew what I wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, for me um. It, I've always loved movies and I always loved the old monster movies and stuff. And um, then I grew up in the sixties. Um, and um, when I saw the original Planet of the Apes in the theater with my dad, <laughs> that, that was when I was fully bitten at that point. It was like, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. You know, that was it. That was in 1968. And so I just started delving into it as a kid, trying to learn everything I could about how to do this kind of stuff. And at that point, who was doing it? I reached out to a lot of these people when I was a kid and I would send them photographs of the work I was doing with uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes with asking them for advice you know, as far as looking at the photos and advice. And then if they would send my stuff back and, you know, give me, you know, advice on how I could do it better. Never heard from anybody. <laughs> Never heard from anybody. Never got any of my photos. I don't have photos of any of my old stuff because I sent them all away. I don't have any of that stuff anymore. Um, so I kind of promised myself then that I wouldn't uh, treat people that way and I wouldn't do that uh, if I ever got into this and made it. And I've held true to that promise. Anybody that contacts me, I'll, I'll talk to them and try to help them and guide them in the right direction. I used to teach a lot. I stopped so much teaching now, to be honest, because I'm sad to say that I'm finding the newer generation um, tougher to deal with. And the reason why I say that, and to give you an example, you, you work in production there now, so you understand a little bit of what I'm talking about, where it, it, things have changed completely. Even before Corona, things have changed, and you can't just freely walk onto a set anymore. You have to get, you know, approved and from production to sign walk onto a NDAs, set. Sign NDAs. Yeah, exactly. And you have to be covered by the insurance from production if you're even visiting on set so it's a whole as you know it's it's not easy so i would go to bat a lot of times for a lot of my young students and stuff that i was you know taking on and say you know okay let's i want them on set to see you know experience this so i'd do that and i'd make sure and jump through all the hoops and you know get the approval from producers and the insurance and stuff like that so that they can come on set well i had this one um this has been, this was what, back in 20, this was when I first moved back. And it was a little movie I was doing called, um, well, wh while we were shooting it, it was called, um, I, think called the, I think it came out, I think they released the movies called The Devil's Hand. Uh, not a good film, horror film. Um, I think it, when we shot it, it was called The Occult. I like the director, he was trying to make a, a decent little picture with producers wouldn't let him do what he was wanting to do and it turned out bad but anyway this girl contacted me i had a lot of effects on that film and this girl contacted me and said she was interested in learning so i said you know so we were talking on the phone she seemed legit so i said hey i'll work it out you come to the set you know she well i worked it out so she came to the set the day we were doing a full day of prosthetics i mean 
when she arrived in the trailer, literally had all the prosthetics lined up and everything was out ready to go. <clears throat> and I'm not, major, I'm not making this up. I'm not even exaggerating this. This is almost word for word what happened and why I've quit doing that now because she literally walked into the trailer, walked in the door, saw everything laid out. She goes, Oh no, 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 no. I'm not interested in any of this. I just want to know how I can contact Leonardo DiCaprio and Johnny Depp to be their personal. And for the first time for me as well, because I'm usually trying to be nice to people. I said, let me tell you something. It doesn't work like that. There's the door you just walked in through. Goodbye. It doesn't work that way. That's it. <laughs> Some people yeah. you wonder like, where's their brain? You know? It's yeah. Like, you know, what you think what the hell was she thinking? Yeah. I mean it's like no experience whatsoever. And that's how she walks in and starts it. It's like yeah. nah, no. unprofessional and just uh, you know no yeah. way to be, no way to be. You know, no. Yeah. It was. Insane. I've seen that. I've seen that as well. You know, I've seen, you know, like people. You know, they say, "Don't get what are you doing." You know, don't get your phones out. People get their phones out, but they go up to the main actors. They go, oh, "Can I have a picture with you?" You know, like Johnny Depp, and, and um, you know, then people get taken off the set, and then they get they get blacklisted, and then they'll never work again. And you know, and just just don't do it you just don't do it stupid thing to do you know it's yeah. people don't think you know people don't think it's, it's a job it's a work to be professional yeah you know yeah. you know you know you don't you just like uh i wouldn't go up to you know like i remember some people uh worked on the uh some people i know worked on the iron lady which was with meryl street yeah and i think um some people went up to meryl street and some extras and some background and stuff and stand in people and they were like um yeah they went up to her and said oh can i have a photo and they were told not to do it and yet they do it and you know yeah. the you just don't do it if you get told not to do it you don't do it and you're working and the whole point is that you know you be professional it's not like you know it's, it's just you don't do it you don't do it exactly you know? exactly you know? yeah you know? you've got to respect people's boundaries and um, they're yep. working they're working just as you're working and you just don't do it you know? No, that's true. And that's like a, yeah, go on, carry on. No, no, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say like, uh, yeah, so so, uh, how did you get, you know, the job for Blue Velvet? How did you, you know? That was actually a fun one, actually, um, how that all came about. Um, I, I started, I did my first film in 1980. And actually, I got my first film while I was still in college. I was 19 when I did my first film. And... <clears throat> At that point, I was living in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I was in university uh, at University of North Carolina in Greensboro in the theater department um, because my, I originally went in for broadcast cinema, but my first semester there, and I, I'm not trying to sound egotistical, but my first semester there, I had more knowledge than I, I ended up co-teaching my first semester there. So I, I've quickly learned I wasn't learning, <laughs> which is what I went there for. So I switched my major to theater and then started, you know, actually doing and therefore learning, you know, uh, which I liked better. Um, but I always wanted to do film. Uh, but living in where I was, I didn't think that was going to be possible, you know. Um, so. I continued that down that road and I would do the makeup for all the, sh you know, productions that they would do there, stage productions and stuff, but I would push the envelope all the time. And we were doing a, um, um, Ira Levine's death trap. I don't know if you're familiar with the play or not, but it's a great play. What's that about? Um, What's that about? Um, it's an old play. They even did a movie back in the, I think early eighties of it with, uh, Christopher Reeves and, uh, um, it's 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 two murder mystery writers writing um, a new murder mystery, but there's actually people getting bumped off for real. <laughs> so it's like a who done it? It's it's it's, okay, it's a fun um, show. Agatha Christie mystery, yeah, type thing. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But but um, 
anytime I'd ever seen that production done, or I mean, that's the way it was done at that time. There's several things that happen uh, as far as the, the, the killings in it that are, you know, it's the way it's written. Um, a guy gets shot with a crossbow. Um, a guy gets bludgeoned to death and a guy gets choked to death with a garrote. Um, but anytime I've ever seen these things happen, of course, you don't really see them happening on stage. You know, like the, the crossbow guy, he walks off stage and the guy with the crossbow is on stage. He fires a crossbow, you know, off stage and the guy walks back on with an arrow stuck in, uh, you know, stuff like that. So I talked the director into when we started this production of this run of this show, I said, let's don't have anyone ever leave the stage. I said, let's see everything happen on stage in front of people. And I said, we'll freak them out. And I devised all the ways to do it. And I, I, I just used all my knowledge from all my studies as a kid, as far as using old, and I mean old, like the arrow rig, you know, the old Western rigs and stuff. And I figured out how to do all this stuff. And everybody had all the stuff on them the whole time, never left stage. And you see this stuff happen on stage and it, and to the point too, with the guy getting choked with the garrote, I didn't, I didn't stop there. I made the garrote like a wire looking garrote. And so then when it did not just choke him out, it cut into his neck and his neck started bleeding right there in front of everybody on stage and stuff like that. So it freaked people out to see this stuff, you know, happening in front of them on live on stage. And like I said, I was 19 years old. And one night after one of the, of the performances, this guy came backstage and was saying, who did the effects? And all my friends were like pointing over at me when I'm literally in the corner of the stage, packing up my little makeup kit to go home for that night. This guy came up and says, have you ever done a movie? I was 19 years old. Like I said, I said, no. He goes, he goes, you want to? I go, yes. This guy ended up being a producer who hired me to do that night right there on the spot, hired me to do his new movie, which is called the membrane, which was a, I ended up doing the movie, but it was a terrible movie, <laughs> but I ended up doing the, 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 all the effects and making actual the membrane creature and that kind of stuff for this really bad film in 1980. And uh, like I said, it was, I was 19. I left school to do it and never looked back. Uh, I started going at that point from, really one bad low budget horror film to the next at that point loving it actually just having a blast you know doing what i always wanted to do and was loving it and then i got hooked up um with dino de laurentis a really famous uh italian producer. producer and the whole way i got hooked up with him was actually of fun and I think you'll enjoy this too because I think you even mentioned some of his films there was a director named Richard Fleischer who um Solent Green for one um I met Richard while I was in college he came to do a speak he came to speak to our students and stuff and the students would ask questions and they were to me, they were just asking lame questions and stupid stuff too. Like you shouldn't even, like you said, respect how much money you make and stuff like It's like, mm -hmm. no, no, stop that. Mm -hmm. So I raised my hand after a while and I said, what did your father think of you directing 20,000 leagues under the sea for Walt Disney? You should have seen his face when I asked him that question. He said, well, wow. <laughs> because I went to my father for permission. Richard Fleischer's father was Max Fleischer, who Disney made it his thing to destroy. Max Fleischer and Disney were rivals at the beginning um, to see who could get the first full length animated motion picture completed. Disney did Snow White, Fleischer did Gulliver's Travel. It was all happening at the same time. And Disney actually said out loud to people that it was his mission to destroy Fleischer. Fleischer created Popeye, Betty Boop, the original Superman cartoons, which are still great, actually. Um, that was all Max Fleischer. So I, he said, I went to my father before I took the job to ask his permission. 
And he goes, my father gave me the best advice, he says, that I've ever been given, which turned out to be very true. He says, take the job. You'd be crazy not to, but go into it realizing that no matter if you do, you know, a great job or a bad job, but especially let's hope you do a good job and it becomes a big hit, that film will never be a Richard Fleischer movie. It will always be a Walt Disney movie. And he's right about that. Yeah, no, he is. He is. I mean, because, yeah. uh, you know, it is, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. they're even talking about remaking it. Well, they were talking about remaking it uh, recently or a while back. So, uh, again, yeah, I, heard, so, you know, I heard rumors of that too. Yeah. Uh, so, after this whole evening, he actually, him and his wife actually sought me out in the crowd because <laughs> he's like, How do you know who my father was? And I said, Man, I'm a huge animation buff. Still am. I collect animation art. Have a huge collection. Um, so he took me out to dinner. Him and his wife took me out to dinner that night afterwards. And we just talked. And uh, he said, what do you want to do? And I told him, I said, I want to be a makeup artist. So it was actually Richard Fleischer <laughs> who introduced me to Dino De Laurentiis back in the early 80s. And the first film that I was offered was actually uh, by Dino was Richard Fleischer's Amityville 3D. They sent me the script and I did something which I'm so glad I did. I read the script and I realized this is above my head. I can't do this at my skill set. I'm gonna jump into this and fail if I do this because I don't know enough yet. And without uh, so I, I was honest with Dino and I told him that and instead of that turning him off that sealed our fate from that point on he loved the fact that I was honest with him so he uh, later he kept he kept in touch with me and then later uh, offered me uh, uh, Cat's Eye a Stephen King film I know that one yeah yeah, in one. 1984, when they came and started the studio here for the first time, uh, he called me up and offered me that, that movie because I was honest with him about Amityville. And so he sent me the script. I read the script and I said, I can do this. <laughs> and so that was the beginning of a, of a, uh, of a relationship with uh, Dino De four, four year relationship uh, with Dino of just doing nothing but films really for him for almost four years um i joke because i left school like i told you to, to to jump into this field and do it so i joke but it's really not a joke that i went to dino university because i worked for dino for four years from 1984 to 1987 and in those four years that's when i really learned as far as um that was my education and it was all due to Dino. Dino would uh, literally put me, I, I, I look back on it now and I just, I'm in awe that I actually experienced what I experienced. I went through kind of like the, the closest thing you could come to the old studio system in my lifetime that, you know, has been gone for decades uh, because I would finish a movie on a Friday or Saturday. We'd wrap the movie. I didn't have to worry Monday morning. Do you want to have me on another movie? I mean, yeah. just like, boom, here, put you, you over know, on this one, put you over here. From one job to the next. You know, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he kind of groomed me really, uh, which I wasn't aware of really when it was happening. But now I look back on it like, Oh my God, it's so, I was so fortunate. He but really now you think, yeah, now you're looking back going, my God, how did I do it? Like, how did yeah. it happen? You know, like, yeah, because I was on this, I was really literally on the path of, uh, and, and nothing against him, of course, because I was a huge fan. I wanted to be Tom Savini. Okay. I love Tom Savini's work, still love Tom Savini's work. Um, because the work that Tom Savini did compared to a lot of the guys, especially out in LA, my, my favorites were Dick Smith and Tom Savini, as far as the makeup work goes. And one of the reasons why too, is because they were actually doing the work. 
It's not like the guys in LA who had shops with tons of people doing the work. No, it was Dick and Tom that were doing their own stuff on the East coast, you know? And that was kind of my thing too. It's like, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, but I was getting pigeonholed or typecast, so to speak, as just being an effects horror guy. And Dino's the one that brought, broke me out of that. And I'm so grateful for that because that gave me a career. Um, and so I was still doing, you know, like I said, the effects and stuff like that. And my first two films for Dino were both Stephen King, which was Cat's Eye and Silver Bullet. And then he put me over onto a very, uh, he put me on a film called Marie, which was not a horror film. It was a, it was actually a really top notch uh, film with, an incredible cast, incredible uh, director and DP and everything. And I, I'm so grateful for that because that's really what broke me out of the mold and made me decide then, you know what? I just want to make good movies. It doesn't matter what the genre is. I want to be involved with good quality, movies. quality, quality. quality. Um, yeah. Exactly. So that's what I always tried to go for um, from that point on. So it was after I did Marie um, for Dino that I got a call to come in for an interview with David Lynch. I had met David Lynch briefly the year before while we were shooting Cat's Eye. We were actually on stage uh, shooting. We were in the upscale, uh, if you remember the film or know the film, Drew Barrymore uh, in the last sequence, because it's a, it's a um, trilogy. It's a uh, Milton Zabotsky, who I, uh, the original Tales from the Crypt, <laughs> actually co-produced Cat's Eye, because it was a, um, a trilogy. A long going trilogy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, the last sequence was Drew Barrymore fighting a little troll in her room. So this uh, one soundstage was built upscale all the furniture and everything was huge to make the troll look like a tiny little troll, you know, and stuff. So we were on this upscale set where everything, you know, chairs, like, you know, almost two stories tall and stuff like this. And this, the stage door open and this man walks onto the stage and I see who it is and I freak out and everybody else is like, what? I said, that's David Lynch. And nobody else had a clue as to who I was talking about. I'm like, come on, Eraserhead, Elephant Man, David Lynch, come on. And they didn't have a clue. So I met him briefly then and freaked out because, like I said, I was already a fan of Lynch. Um, and so I met him briefly then. But then, like I said, I got a call after I did Marie to go in for an interview with David. I go into the office. And the first thing out of David's mouth was, you got a great recommendation from Jack Cardiff. Jack Cardiff was our DP on Cat's Eye. Jack Cardiff is British. He's passed away now, unfortunately. But Jack was one of the most famous DPs in our industry ever. Jack uh, shot the, the Red Shoes. The African Queen. He, he, he directed Sons and Lovers. He, he, he had a great career. Um, and I told David, I said, that's, I said, I appreciate that. But I said, I hardly said five words to Jack the entire time we worked together. Because I was just starting out. I mean, I was, I was, I shut up and listened. I wasn't, you know. And he goes, no, he says, Jack, he said, he watched you and he says, you know what you're doing. So that shocked me and taught me right off the bat in this crazy industry that even when you think people aren't watching they are they're watching <laughs> they're taking they're taking notes they're taking notes yep. of what you're doing i mean uh, exactly i mean i've had it people come to me you know that's this is why you know like um like you say you know I've had people come to me and i didn't expect it and they came to me and even though with all this shutdown that's happened now it's stopped things but i know when things get back to normal or some kind of normality, they'll come back to me again. We stay in touch, always stay in touch um, and be professional about it. And uh, yeah. I, I know that something will come out of it. Good things come out of 
working relationships with people. So, yep. you know, and then like you say, that's how you happen to you, you know? So, um, yep. you know, so I was only, I was only 23 years old when I was hired to do blue velvet by David Lynch that day. <laughs> I turned 24, I turned 24 on the film while we were shooting. Um, and that blew my mind because I, I did a book. You're talking about your book that you did of uh, Hellraiser. I did a book um, on the making of Blue Velvet. Oh, um, wow. Which I'm happy. It took two years. You you did it, so you, you know what I'm talking about. It took yeah. two years to, to, to do it, the book, to actually physically make it and get it done. Um, it's a self-published thing, which I'm not thrilled about, unfortunately, as far as – you get into that, you got no choices sometimes as, as far as cost. Compromise. Compromise, compromise yeah. and cost, because it costs way too much money, in my opinion, um, to buy the damn thing. And even I don't get a break on it. And Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> warned me <laughs> years ago about books, because she's an author. She writes kids' books. And Jamie told me years ago, because I talked about possibly doing this book a long time ago. And she goes, oh, she goes, books. She goes, oh, you'll never make any money on a book unless it's a bestseller. You'll never make any money on a book. She goes, just be aware of that. You'll probably never make a dime. And I said, okay, I don't, I, I don't care. It's a labor of love, this one. And it was. And so I'm, I'm glad I did it. And it turned out good, but it, she's right. I hadn't made a dime. <laughs> I hadn't made any dime. money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See the dime for it. it was just but personal. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't yeah. do it for that, though, anyway. I did it as a love letter to the film. And to get your get memories out of, of working on it to have the time. Well, the main, actually to tell you the truth, the main reason why I really decided uh, to do it was after I moved back to the States, all my stuff had been in storage for all that, you know, over a decade, you know? So when I came back and was going through storage and I was finding you know, boxes and boxes of all these old photographs from, you know, continuity shots from the films and stuff. And I found all my original um, scripts and continuity shots and stuff from all the old films. But when I went through the Blue Velvet ones, it's like, oh, my God. I have to let people see these because, as you know, Blue Velvet, especially Blue Velvet, has such a love or either people love it or hate it. There's no in between, really, with that film. And it's such a dark film that really turns a lot of people off because of the subject matter. The fact that it's just a dark, you know, subject matter. But that's why I had to do this book because looking at the continuity photos and our, you know, just candid photos on, on set, you see, we're having a blast. And you see that in the photos. You see, we're having fun. You see, as despite, the dark, subject matter, despite the subject matter yeah exactly you're having yeah, as, fun, yeah as dark of a film and and you know as that is you got dennis hopper and david lynch photobombing and some of the polaroids and stuff you know just having fun and and it really comes through isabella, isabella rosalini yeah well. yeah i mean it was just yeah. a great cast oh my god the cast was fantastic and we just had a blast together it was very much of a, of a close-knit you know I mean, I still say this, and I teach this a lot with my students. I, I like to say that, to me, the bigger the budget, the bigger the mess on a movie. Absolutely. I much prefer, the, You're I much right. prefer the, the smaller films because on the smaller films, everybody's there because they want to be there. And that makes a huge difference. Bigger films, I'm sorry to say, most of the time, they're just there watching the clock to get a paycheck. I was just going to bring that up, actually, because uh, it's funny because you say that, and, and as well working with Lynch, he had the same thing with Doom, and Doom was yes. a, a big mess. I mean, I, I like the film, regardless of what people say. It's an interesting mess. Yeah, but, I agree. But, you know, it, it, it say that was a huge budget, and it was, it, it, well, it, you know. Doom actually was why we got to do Blue Velvet. Because the Laurent Dino, uh, Dino produced, produced that Dino Dino produced Dune, and they shot Dune in uh, Mexico um, in 1984. Um, that's when I first, like I said, met David in 1984 when he walked on the stage while we were shooting Cat's Eye um, for Dino. And he was just 
finishing up Dune. And Dune was taken away from David in the editing. He didn't get final cut. That always bothered David. And then Dune, of course, you know, like you said, unfortunately, and I don't think deservingly so, because I agree, I think it's an interesting film. It's an interesting film. Um, yeah. But, you know, Dune was a huge flop at the box office. Dune cost $40 million to make. And at that time, that was Untold. the most money. Untold that was amount of money, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Like Heaven's Gate. It was like Heaven's Gate. You know, it was it was like a Heaven's yeah. Gate, you know, it was it was yeah, you know, un, unheard of budget, you know, it's it yeah was huge. You know? So Blue Velvet was Dino's apology to David. He gave um David three and a half million dollars to make Blue Velvet total with no inter with no interference. Control. Create total with no create. interference. Yeah. Total cut and no interference and he stuck and Dino stuck to that. I give him that. He stuck to that. We would see Dino in dailies once in a while, but he, he came, he came to the set the first day, hugged David, wish him luck. And we never saw Dino again until once in a while in dailies. But like I said, he stayed out of it and let David do what he wanted to do. It was Dino's apology to David for Dune. And I'm glad he did it. Cause man, we got to create something that is a masterpiece. Was, it is. I mean, it's, and I knew that, to be honest, I knew that early on. Um, it's the only time I've ever read a script cover to cover in one reading and knew this was something special. Because reading that script, you got to consider this was 1984. When it, when it was, when he wrote it, because it was, it'd been around for yeah. a while. It'd been around for a while. No. He, he'd, he'd had it for a while, you know? Yeah, he, he had three scripts. He had Blue Velvet, One Saliva Bubble, and Ronnie Rocket are the three scripts that he still to this day wants to do the other two. He hasn't yet. Uh, but those are the three scripts that David was always pushing and, and trying to do. Ronnie Rocket, I would love to do. Ronnie Rocket is a, uh, an electric midget. <laughs> I can just so, imagine in David's mind. You know, and, yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, so that was one of the, the great things about Blue Velvet was it was um, it, it was a project that you know everybody was there because they really wanted to be there and and you, and doing it you knew this was something special because there had been nothing like that made at that point point. No. and that's what I don't think a lot of the younger generation now understands that without without Blue Velvet we wouldn't have Quentin Tarantino. We wouldn't have a lot of the films and a lot of the directors, a lot of the people we have now. You're totally if it right. Hadn't been for and Blue I, Velvet, Blue Velvet was kind of like the grandfather of all these, as I like to say, weird cinema. <laughs> well, it's actually right because um, it's funny you say that, and, and specifically because you did the makeup for the year, and 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 Tarantino when he did Reservoir Dogs, it involved uh, someone's ear getting cut off, which was obviously yep. a homage to Blue Velvet. Yeah, and, and it's funny because the guy cutting off the ear was Michael Madsen. And he's also yeah. good. He's also, he was, he was like, one, Dennis Hopper was one of his best friends. So it was like a, yeah. a very, uh, very um, homaging to, um, to, to Blue Velvet, you know, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, the character of Mr. Blonde would have probably hung out with uh, Frank Booth, would have been uh, in good company with Frank Booth. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this one. This is one of my favorites. We started shooting. Um, we started shooting Blue Velvet. We didn't have Frank Booth cast. We didn't have an actor, and we started shooting. Um, while we were shooting, I got word that they finally cast Frank. That it was an, at that point, a up and coming British newcomer, who really was not known at the, in the states at that time. A young fellow named Bob Hoskins was cast originally as Frank Booth. Um, I'll never forget this as long as I live. We were sitting at lunch one day, and David and Kyle, Laura and Isabella and I were all sitting in there. I think even Fred Elms was with us. I love Fred too. I did another movie with Fred. He's the, he was the DP. Um, Love his lighting. Oh. But anyway, we're sitting at lunch one day, and a PA came up and said, David, you have a phone call. And so David left, 
And when he came back, it was actually Kyle that saw him first. And Kyle was like, David, are you okay? Because David was white. He literally was. He As came, a ghost, like a ghost. Yeah. yeah, he was, he was white. I mean, you, you hear that, but I mean, we saw it. He was, he was drained of color. He was white. And like I said, Kyle, I think was the first one that saw him and said, David, are you okay? He goes, I just got off the phone with Dennis Hopper, who says, I must play Frank Booth because I am Frank Booth. And he goes, it scared me so much. I said, okay. But now I don't know what to do because we already hired this other actor. And if he is Frank Booth, how are we going to have lunch with him? I've seen that in many interviews. I've seen that even Dennis saying that as there. well. Yeah. I was yeah. there when it happened. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, it was fantastic. Um, so then years later, cut two years later, I'm doing Super, Super Mario, Mario Brothers. Brothers. And I, I sat there in the trailer that day and I said to Bob and, and Dennis, I said, you realize, guys, I've got all the, the Frank Moose here at the same time. <laughs> they started laughing. Uh, Hoskins was a wonderful man. I worked with him a couple times. In fact, I was working with him when he passed away. Um, we we had just done uh, a uh, mini series together over in Italy, Bob and I, uh, of Pinocchio. And I wrote a script which Bob loved, and Bob was going to produce it and play a little part and produce the, my film. And I literally was packing my bags to uh, go to England to start prep on my film uh, when Bob passed away. I'm in touch with uh, Bob's son, uh, Alex. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. So, um, but nice. yeah, Bob was a wonderful. Bob was a wonderful man. I never got to meet him, but from I've been told by people he's an absolute gentleman. And, uh, he was. He was know. a sweetheart of a man. He, uh, he, mm -hmm. yeah. He had a guy, uh, Sammy Pasha, uh, who's still alive. Uh, Sammy Pasha was his personal assistant driver, um, and forever they were actually best friends and they were just su such a delight to see. They would play cards when they weren't shoot. I mean, Sammy was a great guy and really took care of Bob. They, they were just so wonderful together. Um, and yeah, Bob, Bob was a sweetheart of a man. He, he, he died way too young. And he was, he was such a good guy. Very sad. Uh, very yeah. Sad yep. Uh, but yeah, young, was, but, but uh, yep. A lot of people don't realize that Bob was actually originally hired to play Frank Booth. <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't know that. And, yeah, uh, yeah. You know your your book. Um, is that available anywhere? Yeah, the Blue Velvet book. So what what's it called? Just out of interest. Just it's so uh, people know yeah, it's, as well. It's uh, uh, on set Polaroids number one, uh, Blue Velvet. Okay. Um, okay. And you can get it on, Amazon? on Amazon. On uh, Amazon. Blurb. Yeah. Okay. It's it's like I said, it's the self publishing thing. Blurb. If you go on to their website, Blurb, and punch in that title, it'll come up. Oh, There's yeah. three versions of it. There is a uh, uh, ebook, which is the cheapest. Uh, I'm not a. I'm, a I'm, I'm still a fan of actual having yeah, a book. Yeah, physical physical media. I mean, I prefer yeah. physical media. I mean, it's like I do, um, I do too. But know. the one thing that I I came to realize though, once we did this. A good thing about the ebook, which I tell people now, because like I said, I, I still prefer a book, but it's true. Something that I haven't thought about with the ebook is that you can then zoom in on photos and stuff, which you can't do with a book, you know? Exactly. Kind of so, yeah. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. And with the ebook, we included pretty much all the photos, which we couldn't do in the actual physical copy. So interesting. Maybe both, both is having, I have both would be good then. So yeah, if, then, and, if, you know, if you wanted to go that route, that's yeah. that's what I tell people because the ebook has all the photos and you can zoom in. The physical book I like because it's a physical thing, but to me they cost too much. The paperback book is sixty bucks. The hardback is one hundred twenty-five, and I just think wow. that's way way too much money. But the reason being is, like I said, it was kind of out of our hands at that point because of the fact of how thick. It is for one. It's because it's the detail. The detail. It's a good, it's good a size good, book, yeah, yeah. but then also because it was my all my photos. Everything. Which, everything. Everything. It yeah, yeah. it also has to be every page is in color, 
and so mm -hmm. also that makes the price go up. And then of course, because it's color photos, you went through this with your book. I'm yeah, sure I mean, I, I mean, I am um, quality of paper, everything makes such a difference. That's like you know, you got to go up to get the quality. Unfortunately, yeah, you're absolutely right because I mean, my book hasn't it hasn't come out yet, the first book, but it's going to. But like you say, I want yeah. it all, I want it to be color, and it's going to cost more and yeah. all the rest of it. I mean. Yeah, my publisher is like an independent publisher. I suppose it's it's no different from having being self-published, you know. So it's, yeah. it's an independent publisher, but I I did it because um I wanted to do it, and because I've been working on it for about three years, and I thought, why not? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah exactly. You know? yeah. So, you know, it's a labor of it's a labor of love. It's like I said, it's, yeah, it's, it's my love letter. It's my love letter to the movie. Exactly. Is, is I mean, the way I, I, mean, I, I want to see. I want to read that now. I want to see it. So um and. People who who watch the video who watch the video can also know about it now as well. So that's a good thing. I mean, um, yeah, it's really good to know. And and also you were telling me you were saying about um, there was a funny story with Bob Hoskins as well. There was a yeah. funny. Uh, you have to tell me. I'd like to hear that the, the story with Bob Hoskins that you were. Oh, Super yeah. Mario. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. This is actually in a. There's a book. Ah, uh, what's the name of that book? Hang on one second. Hang on. Let me sure. Sure. Hang on. There we go. I don't know if you can see that's that's my book there. Oh, thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, that's, see that's, it. yeah. That's, that's the Blue Velvet book. Um, but then this, when I was living in Italy, uh, Jamie Russell contacted me. He was writing this book, which is Generation Xbox, How Video Games inv Invaded Hollywood. And there's a whole chapter that he wrote in this about the making of Super, Super Mario, Mario Brothers. Brothers. Um, and he contacted me mainly because he had heard that story that I'm getting ready to tell you. And he contacted me to see if it was true. And then he put it, it's in the book, which I'm so happy that that story's in this book because it's one of my favorites. Like I said, I love Bob. And Bob was, uh, Bob was a trooper. And Bob would be the, I mean, he's, he's the one that said this of himself. He said, he said he's four foot squared because he was, <laughs> he was a little fire plug of a guy, but he was agile as, as all get out. He could do a, he could do a, he could stand there and do a backflip. Just, I mean, he was very agile, did most of his own stunt work when it was allowed and stuff. And he really was great. Um, unfortunately on Super Mario Brothers, to be quite honest and blunt, we had a husband and wife team directing that movie rocky morton and annabelle jankel they were married at the time i don't think they still are anymore um they couldn't decide on what to have for lunch much less how to direct a scene together it was a disaster from day one with them it really was they were horrible um we wasted so much money and time with them um in prep even before we rolled the cameras because they, they just didn't know what they wanted. And to me, it's, it shows in the film because um, I've often said that that's a film that really needs to be looked at still to this day by SAG because I feel like there's needs to be something to protect actors from this ever happening again. And there hasn't, and there isn't. We were all hired um, to do this film with a script that was never made. The original film that we all signed on to, and that's how they got Bob Hoskins, Dennis Hopper, Fiona John Shaw, Legolas and John Leguizamo. How they got the actors they got was the original script was actually a very dark, very serious, very different film. Um, it was not a kid's film. In fact, the tagline was Super Mario Bros. This ain't no game. Okay. 
on the first day that everybody arrives to start, you know, pre-production, oh, here's your new script. Completely different and sucked. And I just, I don't understand how that bait and switch happened with the actors that they got everybody. And it pissed off everybody. I mean, Dennis Hopper and Hoskins were just were furious. Um, and rightfully so. You know, it's not the film that any of us signed up to do. And it just got worse with Annabelle and, and Rocky. I mean, they just, they didn't know what they wanted on top of being a bait and switch and a bad script. So it just got, it got worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> At the time, this was in 1991. Oh, 92? No, 92. Yeah, because it, no, yeah, it came out in 93, didn't it? So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, no, sorry, yeah. 92. Yeah. yeah, we were shooting in 92, yeah. Um, it was the biggest film actually shooting um, on the East Coast, for sure. One of the biggest in the States, because it was, we were actually mil? making. About 50 mil, wasn't it? 14, um, 50 million, 40, 50 it was, million. It was in the 50 million 50 range, million. yeah. Um, and um, we had three units shooting simultaneously the entire time on that film as well. Uh, people don't realize that. We had a first unit, second, full second unit, and a third visual effects unit shooting simultaneously the whole time. Uh, it, was, it was crazy. So anyway, like I said, Bob was a trooper. Did most of his own stunt work when it was allowed. We were shooting a sequence in the Boom Boom Bar set where Bob has to leap through the air to grab the necklace that uh, the lady was throwing that he's trying to get the- Big Bertha. The, Big Bertha. Big Bertha, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. She throws the necklace and Bob's got to jump in the air and catch this, this necklace. So we're doing take after take after take. Bob's giving it his all. J Bob jumps, I mean, and he's doing it. You know, you see it in the film. He's boom, he's doing it. He's perfect Mario. Yeah he, yeah, he was. He was great. Um, and Annabelle, and we, we were shooting this, uh, the production design was actually one of the best things in the film. David Snyder was a production designer. Who I know David. Blade. I know David. David's, David's great. Yeah, David's I've great guy. I've interviewed David. I, yeah, great, I, great. Yeah, he's, oh, he's great. We, 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 we spoke great for guy. so long. I'm in touch with him. He's on Facebook as well. So um, Yeah, his daughter, yeah. Uh, his daughter Amy was actually one of my makeup assistants on Mario. Um, she she was great, and David, I love David. David's great. I mean, oh. good God, Blade unbelievable work. Uh, even <laughs> super, even whatever you say about the film, I mean, I love the film Super Mario Bros. Even though it, people might not like it, you have to admire what the work that went into it. So it was, it no, was, I'm so saying his oh, work on yeah. the film is oh. was phenomenal. Yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. We shot it. We shot it in an abandoned uh, cement factory that he refurbished and made this. North Carolina. You know, yeah, um, so it was very hot and unpleasant place to shoot to begin with, but, um, so that's where we were. And Annabelle Janko comes up to Bob after we've done so many takes of him jumping through the air, doing this. And, um, you gotta remember, Bob did not care for these directors. Okay. And so Annabelle comes up to him and says literally this, and this is the story that's in the book. She goes, Bob, on this next take, try to linger in the air a little longer. And Bob just looked at her and goes, honey, I'm doing the best I can. And I go, Bob, Wally Coyote could do that. And we, Bob and I, he turns and looks at me and we start talking about Wally Coyote like he's a real person. Um, I, I said, you know, Wally Coyote could do it. And Bob said, I, I know. I said, well, you worked with him, didn't you? Roger Rabbit, you know? Yeah, and so yeah, we started talking Rabbit. about Wally Cody like he's a real person. And Annabelle, you could see the look on Annabelle's face. She just looks at us and she shuts up and wanders away. And Bob, when she, as soon as she left, Bob turned to me. He called me, Bob used to call me kid. That's what he'd call me all the time. She walked away. And as soon as she did, Bob turned to me and says, Kid, that was great. Anytime <laughs> she's around, do Let's that. do that yeah. so she'll fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bob. Uh, I loved him. I loved him. Yeah. He was a trooper then on that film. 
Yeah, he, he really he really was. He hated to talk about Mario Brothers. He, I know. He they all did. They all did, didn't they? I mean, Dennis didn't like it. And... Yeah, I mean, I, I kept. I mean, Dennis and I worked together uh, a lot. Uh, we only did two movies together. Well, both of them. I did two movies with both of them, with Bob and Dennis. But Dennis and I worked together. Oh, good God, I've lost count how many photo shoots and crap Dennis and I did together over the decades. Um, both were fantastic guys, both fantastic. Um, and I, I love both of them. And, and I, think they both, both of them. I think they were both great in the film. I think the actors were good in the film. Yeah, you know, no, they yeah, are. And all the actors, I mean, um, are, yeah. I mean, I, it's like, uh, I don't know if you heard of the Super Mario Brothers archive, you know, the SMB movie archive. Yeah, I actually yeah. did an interview with them. Yeah, and they're, got an they're, on there. they're they're trying to put together a director's cut of the film, and they've um, digitized a lot of stuff. They digitized the they found a lot of um, VHS tapes, uh, yeah. work print stuff, and they they they're, they're uh, upgrading it, digitizing it, so that people can see what they're trying to sort it's, of you know. It's a weird one because I mean that movie has such for me it really has a love hate relationship because being a part of it and knowing what it what went on what happened what went on what on. it was could have been and what you know because i know from my from, problem yeah my problem with the film is is the fact that I, I think it really uh suffered because of annabelle and, and and rocky because to me it shows in the finished product because i don't think they knew well they i mean they obviously know what they wanted we knew that but that's my my point of the film is it wasn't geared towards anyone it wasn't a kid's film it wasn't an adult film it, it was uh, just it, all over the place. A, a yeah, just, mix, it, wasn't, it wasn't geared to anyone. It didn't have a you know a rhyme or reason. Um, but it's funny to me that that film has such a now kind of a, a bit of a cult following and, and a you know legs, which I didn't think that film would have. So it's not one of my favorites, obviously. No, no I think because of what happened. I am I mean, happy, but yeah. I am happy that people still do, you know, enjoy our work you know, I, so. I i actually um i love that film and know the story behind it obviously and um but i think uh, like you say the script changed and i think it could have been an, yeah. a, an even greater film you know i think yeah. it could have been a lot better i mean i think um i don't get me wrong i, I love that it went it went like a wacky route it went like a dark route and there's some great things in the film uh, despite whatever flaws i think the effects and stuff and, and the makeup and the performances and the ideas are interesting. They could have been taken further. I think uh, Dennis Hopper as Cooper was, was great. You know, I mean, uh, well, well, and, one know. of my, one of my, uh, hang on, I'll get it and show you. Hang on. I've never, I've never published this photo to the public before, and I didn't include it in my Blue Velvet book because I didn't want to tarnish Blue Velvet with Mario. <laughs> but this is actually one of my prized possessions. Oh man, that's unbelievable! Right. Now the reason why it's my prized possession was this was a goof because we were doing two different. We were doing a <laughs> shot of him with a chainsaw. And then we did a separate too. shot with the baby. But he decided he wanted to do one with both together as a goof. But then he signed this to me. And that's why it's my, it's a, it's a treasure to me. Because this is what he wrote, okay, on here. For Jeffrey. Nobody calls me Jeffrey, but my mom and Dennis Hopper. <laughs> but it's my real name. But I just go by Jeff. But for Jeffrey. Thanks for making me like this again. Frank Booth Lizard. Love, Dennis Hopper. Oh, I love yeah. that. That's <laughs> unbelievable, yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I, mean, I love that. That, that, is, that is cool. That is yep. really cool. <laughs> it's, it's funny because, um, you know, um, it's like a, it, it's become a cult film. It's become a yeah. real cult film. I mean, uh, and, yeah. and Dennis was, uh, I think, prior to Blue Velvet as well. Like, it's funny, he had the chainsaw then, but he was in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, which was another yeah. 
uh, carnival of mayhem. Uh, yep. You know, an absolute um, kind of, uh, you know, just a mad film as well. And uh, I think yep. even even Super Mario Bros. the film is, is just, uh, it's completely bonkers, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's uh, yeah, because I think as well, what, what it is is that, is that because you worked on it, you know what it was like, so it was hell. But yeah. I think um, <laughs> it's like, um, but it's funny because that, that film has been reappraised. You know, it's been, um, a lot of people love it. So it's like, um, it's, it's funny. Oh, I, I, get, I get hit up all the time. Yeah, I get hit up all the time about that film. And that's why I said it just, it's shocking to me. And it, it has such a fan base because like I said, it's not my favorite, but it's got a huge fan base. And I get hit up all the time for, either interviews or just, you know, people asking about that film and yeah. crazy enough too. Um, I, uh, I don't really talk about awards that much, but I mean, I've, I've, I've won, uh, you know, a few awards, but Mario brothers is actually Saturn. Saturn huh? The Saturn. Awards? I, well, I was nominated for the Saturn award. We didn't win, but we were nominated for the Saturn award. But what, people really don't understand is I got real close to getting an Oscar nomination for Super Mario Brothers. I've been what's called shortlisted three times in my career and people don't understand it um, because the process doesn't make sense and it's not fair to be honest. And to be, and let's be quite clear here, the Oscars, uh, you buy them. It's money. You buy them. Um, but anyway, I was what's called shortlisted three times for the Oscar for makeup. First time was for Blue Velvet. Um, the shortlist, no other category except for makeup and visual effects, and I think sound effects. I think there's still the three categories that are still this way. Um, visual effects may have changed now, but I know those were the three. Makeup is still that way, where we don't have five nominees like everybody else. There's only three nominees. So what they do is they have what they call the short list, which are the five. And then from those, from the short list, you then get the three nominees. So I was shortlisted for Blue Velvet, Last of the Mohicans, and Super Mario Brothers came closest to actually getting the nomination for Super Mario Brothers. For the one that was the most craziest, craziest one to work on. It blows my mind yeah. to think that that, for, I mean, I even called Vinny, uh, the guy, that, uh, a friend of mine, who, Vinny Guastini, who did the uh, effects with me on that. Um, I called up Vinny when the Academy first approached me. And I'm like, Vinny, you're not going to believe this, but they're, talking to us about you know another oscar nomination he goes great what film oh. i said super mario Brothers. <laughs> and he's and he had the same reaction i did what really <laughs> 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 yeah, i had the same reaction bud so yeah uh it, it was it was weird but yeah i came closest to get the damn not oscar nod for, for that damn movie than any other movie so it's crazy yeah <laughs> You never know. Yeah. You never know. No, it's uh, yeah. imagine if you won it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm but... actually, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, honestly, I'm surprised the film. Uh, I know it came out the same year as Jurassic Park. So um, yeah, but I they think they've been shot at the same time. They've been shot at the same time. They both about dinosaurs as well. But yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and I'm guessing it's a shame it didn't get. Because I, I think it got was going to get nominated for a whole. It was shortlisted for a whole bunch of things. I'm sure makeup and production design, and I'm sure it, it deserved something because because definitely the, the the visual and the effects were they, well, they, te technically you know, and the makeup yeah, as well. Te and the makeup it was a groundbreaking film. Yeah, um, first video game. Realize. First video game film, right? I'm sure it was the first because uh, Christopher Woods was the guy that was heading up. Excuse me the visual effects and directed the, the third unit, the visual effects unit, Christopher directly directed that unit. Uh, his work was phenomenal and his work was groundbreaking because we, we actually did things for the first time in that film that people aren't even aware of. 
Um, Mario is actually the first film where we do crowd replication through CG and things like that, which had never been done before. Um, so it, on some levels like that, as far as technically, it was a groundbreaking film. And visually, it's stunning, I think. Yeah, in some I, think ways, I think some of it's visually amazing, stunning. Amazing, yeah. Um, no. But it just was, you know, it's a kind of a train wreck of a film, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I think, um, Sonny, uh, when's the last time you, you watched it? Because they, they recently, I haven't watched um, it in a while, actually. I've got the, uh, I've got, they, remastered it, they remastered it here in the UK, and they had a brand new documentary on it. And, uh, I, I, know, got, I, I got a copy of that disc on Blu-ray, but I don't have um, a Blu-ray player that will actually play it. Okay. Because it's a, it's because it's, it's English, right? Because it's from the UK, right? Well, yeah. it's it's uh, region B. Blu-ray, DVD with the European system, you can get players here that will play both. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Blu-ray, no, no, you can't you can't get a player that'll play all system uh, Blu-rays. Um, so I did get a copy of that mainly for that documentary because I've never seen that it's, documentary. Oh, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting documentary because. Rocky and Annabelle on it, like everyone's on it, you know, I mean, obviously they do have a little, little kind of interviews with Bob with when he was alive. Yeah. Um, like just kind of mainly kind of stuff that he was doing at the time, but um, uh, also, but they had like uh, the, the effects guys, the, the makeup guys and, and um, John Leguizamo and, and, but I know that I'm involved with the, I'm involved with the, there's a new documentary then they're doing on the Mario Brothers film and I'm involved with that. So, uh, trust the fungus. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. And that's being, um, edited, but that's got like Big Bertha in and Samantha Mathis. And, and, and Samantha, uh, I just worked, I've worked with Samantha a couple of times in the last couple of years. Again. Funny, what were you, cause what, you don't really see, you know, what, you don't really see much of her anymore. You know, she pops up every now and then. I know she does, she does work. Still, I did a, so. Yeah, no, she's mm -hmm. she's really sweet. Um, we did I did a series with her, which she's only in. The, we did the three we did all three seasons, which is the longest thing I've ever done. Um, I didn't used to do television that much. I'm starting to do more television now because I actually think TV's getting better. To be honest, as far as the long format. Oh, it is. It is. The quality is higher. Quality. Yeah. Quality of TV's going up and movies. TV's going, going down. down. So it's going because yeah. they can do more with the series. Even though exactly. Because the thing is, I find that with because um, HBO are doing Hellraiser series now, which is yeah. going to be like yes, that that'll be good. If they, if, you know, the quality is good because ah, that cool. could use it. That because there's, there's an interesting concept they could do. Yeah. You know, with with the series like the Cenobites yeah. and. Yeah, the hell world and all the labyrinth. And they could, you know, that is cool. Like, that is cool. You know, I mean, um, who's doing that? That is the guy, Danny. Uh, it's the guy with the new Halloween. Um, but it's I know Clive Barker is going to be an executive producer on it. But so uh, let me just have a look. I'll tell you now. I know. Oh, David Gordon Green. Yes, David Gordon Green. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So, well, yeah. he, I mean, he's yeah. doing the pilot. He's doing the pilot. I think anyway. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Not a fan. Oh, you're not a fan, no. No, no they they do the Halloween films here. Um, the, the last, the, the last two. They they they're, they're doing. They're getting ready to do. A, they're trying to do a third, third one. one. Yeah. yeah. Um, that whole group that he's involved with. Um, I did one picture with them. Never again. <laughs> Never again. No, I, I didn't like that group. Um, I, I have to say, I did. I do like the reboot they did of Halloween. Though. It's good. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, it is good. I mean, um, yep. it's like um, I'm glad you Jamie, like Jamie. Jamie's an old friend of mine. I did a movie with Jamie. Oh, she was Love good. In, oh, I mean, um, oh, she's, she's good. Yeah, she, she's. Uh, I mean, she's done other stuff. She's done other. She's done loads of other stuff as well. You know what I mean, so it's like. Uh, yeah. She's just known as screen queen, but she's done the whole. Oh yeah. You know, a whole slew of other stuff. You know, I mean, I, I remember trading places and. Um. Yep stuff that she did in the 90s she didn't she you know stuff that she's done that's no one's seen um it was a there's one where she played a cop i can't remember what it is but i think all of blue, Stone, blue steel blue steel that was it yeah blue steel good and, uh, it's a good film yeah blue she's steel, good yeah yeah, yeah no, 
unfortunately, I did a film with her, which she hates. She, it's one of the films she won't talk about. <laughs> which one's uh, that? Virus. Oh, I know the one. Yeah, that just had its anniversary. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, I, I, did, I, I did that with her. Yeah. And she hated it. She's, she's <laughs> fun. Yeah, she's fun. But yeah, she hated that whole experience. But she's, I mean, she's a character. Yeah, sure. She is. I mean, uh, her yeah. family and stuff as well, isn't it? You know, she's. she's uh, I was gonna say it's, it's in her genes. It's yes. In her genes, you know. Um, the scream, the scream queen. The scream queen. Mom, yeah. her mom was the original the psycho, scream queen. The psycho, yeah. And uh, Halloween, yeah. It's it's. Uh, dude, like I, fact, you, I made yeah. a I made a deal with Jamie at the very beginning of the film. I said, okay, um, you just have to uh, you have to promise me one thing. And she goes, what's that? I said, I want to have. Uh, I want to meet and have lunch with your mom one day. And she made that happen. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I had a great day with Janet Lee one time. So yeah, yeah, it's good. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I mean, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so you, you worked on the last of the Mohicans as well. So that must have been yeah. Michael Mann. I did two, I, I did two films with Michael Mann. Um, he's a, uh, he's a tough customer. Uh, but he makes great films. And that's one of the things I kind of like, uh, like I said, I can put up with a lot when I know the end result's worth it. When the quality and, is good. Yeah. And with Michael, that's, that's what you're getting yourself into. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. He is, but I, uh, I like that when it's for the right reasons. Um, I, the first film I did with him, which I'm not credited on at all. Beef? Um, huh? Did you work on, oh, you must've been too young. Beef. That, that was you were too young. Man. I love Thief. I didn't. I did not do Thief. Yeah. Uh, my first film with him was uh, Manhunter. Oh yeah, Manhunter. Yeah, that was just. Before, was that before Blue Velvet? That we just, actually. I went over. Like I said, Dino used to put me. Like I said, I would oh, finish the film. And, he produced. So Dino. He produced. We, the they were going Manhunter. at the same time. Wow. Um, and so yeah. we finished Blue Velvet, and as soon as I finished Blue Velvet, Dino put me over on Manhunter. Manhunter. And I was, uh, I don't know if you know this story at all. Most people don't. Um, Manhunter is a very interesting uh, story. Uh, and, and, and people don't understand why I did what I did. Um, if you know the book, Red Dragon. Red Dragon. Yeah. All yeah. right. We were shooting... The, the script for Manhunter was very close and to the, on, and, and, and to the book. The movie's not. Reason why, we were shooting a sequence at Dollar Hyde's house, which if you remember in the film was glass. It was glass all on both sides and glass cubes and big glass windows on both sides of this house which was a house that they constructed for the film. It was totally fake and made for the movie. And we were getting ready to shoot. It was a night's, a night's uh, scene. We were getting ready to shoot the sequence where the cops come and have a huge shootout with Dollar Hyde and Dollar Hyde's house blows up. And they think Dollar Hyde's dead because they find a dead body in it and blah, 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 like in the book. But he's not dead. It's another body. So anyway, we're getting ready to shoot that or start that whole sequence of the big shootout and to blow up Dollar Hyde's house. This was 1985 when we were shooting this. Um, Stefano Fava, who was the head of the makeup department on uh, Manhunter, and I were standing together over at the craft service table getting a cup of coffee because it was a night shot. And we're standing there, and all of a sudden I hear, shoo, shoo. Like, what, what the heck is that? It was a weird sound. It's like, what? And then all of a sudden we hear, hit the deck, hit, everybody hit the ground, hit the deck. So we just hit the ground. What was whizzing by my head that I was hearing were bullets. Oh. <laughs> Michael Mann who was coked up out of his mind Jesus. got mad at the physical effects guys because they were doing 
bullet hits on the glass that he didn't like and think looked real. So coked up Michael, and this is something that still to this day, there's been many lawsuits. Michael Mann lost his DGA license or card for years yes, because of this, because because of this of the... incident. Uh, he got a gun with live ammunition and said, this is what they look like. And of course it was a glass house. So the bullets were going through it to us on the other side of the house. <laughs> so you know, to get killed. Exactly. So when this happened, rightfully so, most of the crew packed up their shit and quit and left right then and there. I did not. <laughs> Michael Mann went and locked himself in his trailer and rewrote the end of the film right then and there. As we all waited outside, this was a Friday evening, okay? He came back out, handed us all these new pages. We start shooting to finish the film. We shot straight through. I got home Sunday evening. We shot straight through to finish wow. the film. And looking back on it now, so the whole end sequence with Dollar Hyde in the shootout there and uh, 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 Will Graham come crashing through the glass the window, window, window. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. The, the whole shootout, the whole, the whole end shootout and all, every, everything you see in the film. Yeah. We shot all, like I said, through Friday evening, all the way through Saturday. And I got home you know, Sunday evening. We shot all the way through to finish this. Um, so it completely changed the ending of the movie. Uh, but that's why that film is the way it is. And looking back on it now, it actually was one of the most fun times I've ever had on a movie. Because it was total guerrilla film movie making. making. Completely. There were only like, there were only like, I swear, eight of us left. So it was just eight of us, basically. Together doing and just everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. And so that's just why. Picking up, just picking up the camera and just going. Just completely yeah. going all out. Yeah. yeah. And so if you go back and you look at that film again and you'll you look at the end sequence, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to watch it works. tonight. I'm going to watch that's, it tonight. That's one of the amazing things is it works. The whole Inna Gada Vida. Uh, which is used to the music and the, the whole disjointed kind of jerkiness of the whole thing. Down, 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 down. <laughs> it worked Not, yeah, yeah. because we had to, because we didn't have anything. All right. I didn't have, we didn't have squibs. We didn't have, we didn't have nothing. So I'm doing literally everything with monofilament pullaways. Uh, on, it's on, quite raw. On yeah, it's a raw, that specific bit at the end is raw. It's exactly. really, you know, it's yeah. really, the way it's yeah. shot is just chaos. It's just, yeah. it's like because real it, gritty, you know, it looks real, you know, it's, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm literally doing all that with monofilament, old school monofilament pullaways. When the guy, when the cop goes to the door and you see, and he's got the shotgun and you see that back of his head. That's, again, that's me pulling away, you know, with the monofilament shit, doing, doing old school tricks and doing all this stuff. And Dollar Hide, when he gets shot, and same thing, I'm just I'm pulling away little monofilament things to do the, you know, hit bullet hits and stuff on him. We didn't have anything. Poor uh, William Peterson, Trooper. The main trooper, actor, the lead trooper. actor. The lead actor, yeah. yeah he yeah. played Will Graham, the lead actor. Um, he got, uh, he got cut really badly uh, <coughs> because, again, we didn't have anything. So when he jumps in, um, when he jumps through that glass window, the glass um, that was on the floor, it was real glass. It wasn't candy glass. We didn't have anything. Didn't have time. Didn't have time. Everybody, didn't have time. Well, everybody, time. But everybody, everybody quit and packed everyone their quit. stuff and left. So we yeah. didn't have anything. So unfortunately, when William hit the ground with that glass, it's real. he cut his leg really badly, and he had to have stitches inside and out. So that last sequence of, of him, which is a kind of a silhouette shot of him on the dock, after it's all said and done, and he's kind of slumped. It's in pain. The reason why he's slumped. Because he's in pain. He's actually in pain. He's li Oh, w w more than that, he's in pain. He's literally being held up by a C-stand. Jesus. He could, yeah. 
he was he was almost unconscious. <laughs> give, the, give the man an Oscar. Give the man an Oscar. I'm telling you, he put up with a lot. He put up with a lot. But that experience, looking back out now, over so many time to- after you know so many years, it really has become one of those moments that I was like, you know what? That's probably one of the most fun times I've ever had on a film. So that was what was funny was when they called me to do um, Last of the Mohicans. My first question to the producer when he called me was. How's Michael doing? Yeah. Considering the man shot at me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so Michael and I always had this kind of uh, unspoken uh, uh, relationship. Understanding I'm sure he important. kind of he probably respected that. Um, you know, he probably uh, regrets. Well, that's why he. Uh, that's why regrets, I got hired. Uh, from, well, yeah. that's exactly why I got hired yeah. for Mohicans. Was he did? I'm, I'm not credited at all on Manhunter. I don't have a screen credit at all. But Mohicans, you do. All the, can, that, yeah. the end sequence. I mean, that's, but yeah, but that, that got me Mohicans. Yeah. That got you Mohicans, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and then, but then you had such a good time and the, the story from it is pretty wild. So, uh, I'm going to have to yeah. watch that film again, actually, because I've it's got actually, on, Man, Manhunter is actually a really good movie. Jinx Bound the Raid. It's a bit, it's a bit forgotten. Huh? It's a forgotten film. It's almost forgotten, isn't it, Manhunter? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a shame because I think it's a good film and it's the introduction of, it's the original Hannibal Lecter. introduction of Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. Lecter. Which, Brian Cox played, which was, he was so good. Yeah. Good actor. I mean, before Silence came around anyway, wasn't it? So, you know, it's, uh, yeah. and Silence yeah. was a bigger, Silence was, uh, was a, you know, even was a bigger hit, wasn't it? Silence of the Lambs. Yep. So, you know, yep. That's, that's sure just was. had its uh, 30th anniversary. So, uh, or is having, yep. is having its 30th anniversary. So, uh, cool. But I so say it's funny, is that some people um, prefer Manhunter to silence there's some people who, who because it's a forgotten one and it's it's overlooked and i mean did you yes. like red did you like red dragon the the, the no new, no I, I didn't i felt like the uh i felt like every version of uh red dragon so far to me has felt like um the, I, I felt like they tr- tried to put the whole book hmm in and you, what you can't do in a movie um and it, i just felt like it was all rushed and condensed rushed like compacted too much i i didn't i didn't care for it where i love it i love yeah. the book I, the book is great yeah uh, thomas harris his, his thomas harris writing in general uh going all the way back to black sunday with him i love his writing and love his books and to me red dragon is a fabulous book that's a fabulous book, um, and I would, I would like to like to see that redone. Redone like again, to be, yeah. To, uh, redone really, again. Really, really do the book, you know. Justice. Actually, Hannibal, the TV series, was good. I like. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I, I feel like they were trying to do that with Hannibal, as far as really do the books properly. Yeah, um, I mean, um, and, it's funny because you know the Thomas Harrell novel Hannibal. Uh, that's a really crazy book. And the yes. film, it was a hard book to adapt into a film. The, well, uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to write that book. He didn't know. That's why he did it. That's why he made it the way it was. Because he just yeah. Said, Thomas Harris. Crazy. Thomas Harris didn't want to write any more Hannibal, Hannibal stuff. He, he was done yeah. with it, and so that's why he wrote the uh, Hannibal. The, the way he did was and to kill it. To yeah, he, yeah. he was done with it. To fall in love. To fall it. in love. To them, for them to fall in love, you know. And, yeah. And um, you know, I mean, it's like a crazy book. I mean, it's it's a bizarre. Yeah, bizarre. But I mean, I don't mind the film, the Ridley Scott one. I, I mean, there's parts I like. It's a, it's again, it's a, it's a bit of a jangled mess because they. Yeah, to, to, I mean, it's yeah. got it's it's grown on me. I didn't I didn't care for it that much when it first came out. But now, but now, but now yeah. it's grown on me. And of course, you got Gary Oldman who is Mason Verger. Oh, unbelievable! In every, unbelievable. everything. The makeup. That, that's actually one. Of, that was actually one of my biggest mistakes right there of my career. I did a early early film with gary and loved him we had such a blast it was one of the one of my most i mean fun times with an actor ever um the film we did together was in 1987 it was right after he had just done sid and nancy and i saw that i in fact i was hired to do the film with him and then I went and saw Sid and Nancy. I had, I didn't really know who Gary, who Gary 
was. And when I saw Sid and Nancy, I'm like, oh, my God, this, this guy's incredible. And I was convinced that he probably was going to be a method actor after seeing, you know, Sid and Nancy. Furthest from a method actor as you can get, such an easygoing, great, fun, loving guy. Um, <clears throat> the film I did with him was called Track 29. Um, I'm film directed that. by Nicholas I'm Rogue. Ah, oh, the British director. Very good director. Uh, don't Look Now Wonder and Don't Look Now. and, and Exactly. Oh. Man, of, Man yeah. Who Fell to Earth, Don't Look yeah. Now. Yes. One, he, uh, we lost, uh, unfortunately, we lost Nick. Uh, a think couple of years, years ago. Yeah, two, two years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was old, though. He was like, really, he, he, was, he lived Wonderful. a good life. He was like, yes. he, he's like yeah. almost 100. He's, <laughs> he was like 90 or something. Nick, Nick started out as a, as a DP. He was a brilliant DP uh, before he was a director. And I think that's why he was such a, a good director was he was very visual, you know, but he was, uh, uh, I, I love Nick. Nick was a great guy. Oh, the uh, witches, the witches, his witches, witches? his yep, witches, not was, the remake, that was not, Nick. Not, not the remake, but the original, the original. Yeah. That was yeah. Nick. Oh, yep. unbelievable. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Scary. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so track after we did track 29 together, Gary asked me to be his personal, to, to continue on with him to be his personal makeup artist. <laughs> and like I said, this is 1987. Seven, six, seven, eight. We shot, we shot it in 1987. Yeah. Um, I, and so I, I'll never forget this one. When Gary asked me, I said, Gary, I said, you know, I love you. But I said, man, to me, just doing one make, you know, just one actor would just be so boring. <laughs> And I bet you regret that now. What? Well, yeah, look at the career. Yeah. Look at the career of the films he's done. Yeah. So it's like, boy, was that the dumbest move I ever made. And he went on to play Dracula and, and you know. Dracula, and all, yeah. 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 But, but no, yeah. He, Gary, Gary's a great actor. I think after that, something, something, you know, after you worked with him as well, I think he did um, State of Grace. Yeah, was, great um, film. A great film. Not, again, underrated, overlooked film. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, it was you know. Gary and... Uh, Ed Harris. Yeah, another, and Sean Penn. Another, was it Sean Penn as well? Sean Penn? I believe. Yeah, yeah I think it was, yeah. Um, Ed Harris though as well. Ed Harris. Ed, Ed Harris is another one of my favorite. I, I did a film with Ed and just loved, loved Ed as well. Oh, it's fantastic. Ed, yeah, Ed's, Ed's great. I did a film called Radio with Ed Harris, uh, which is a nice little movie. It's, uh, it was a true story. It was Ed Harris and Cuba Gooding Jr. Okay. Um, what year was that uh, then? What year was that? We shot it in 2002, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it came out in 2003 because um, it was right. That's when I, um, right after I did radios, when I then went um, over to Italy. Um, but it's, it's a nice movie. And Ed was great. Ed's fantastic. It's Ed's own, tough yeah. on Ed. Ed's tough on Ed. He's tough on himself. He's, yeah. He's tough on himself. He's a great actor. Perfectionist. But man, he, he, he tortures himself. He really gets into it. And he, he's, he's tough on himself. I remember I saw... Um, wonderful, wonderful actor. Wonderful I remember man. I saw... Um, there was a... It, uh, it, there was for The Rock. There was deleted scenes yeah. for The Rock. And he really pushed himself in these cut scenes. That's, he what, was like, that's, what, he, that's he, what he does. He was yeah. like, God damn it. You know, and he was like... You know, he was like... Not being an arsehole. He was being an arsehole. So he was like almost attacking himself and not um just really yeah. going angry you know he was like really yeah. getting angry you know not that's people, one of the you know, but and himself he was really putting in putting himself the energy uh, yeah you know. that's one of the things that's fascinating to me and part of my job that i've always loved is being a part of my favorite thing is actually working with the director and actors in prep to create the characters is my favorite thing to do um but then watching the actors throughout change how they well, but how they do their thing and how they work together and the whole you know, I studied I studied acting um, in college and theater and I think that's actually helped me over the years because understand. I actually understand, understand more of what they're going through than the average makeup guy really does because most makeup people don't really they're there to put makeup on people and make them look good. I'm not that kind of makeup guy. <laughs> I'm, in fact, people that are my friends, they joke with that I'm a method makeup artist, which is very true. 
I, I go through what they go through, you know, <laughs> but, uh, and I try to make it real. That's my thing. I try, I, no matter what I do, I always try to make it real. And I think that's important. And that's something that I've always loved. Give you an example, like to see the different acting styles and how it works. I was doing it after Mohicans. JFK? Um, huh? JFK, was it? JFK you worked on? Did you work on Well, JFK? I did. I designed Tommy Lee Jones's makeup for JFK. Gary worked um, on that as well. Gary Oldman worked yeah, on that as well. Yeah. But I wasn't on set uh, for that, uh, for JFK, because I was actually shooting uh, Last of the Mohicans at the same time. Um, cause I'd done a film with Tommy right before I did Mohicans and I love Tommy Lee Jones. I, I, all the actors I love are the kinds we used to talking about the, the uh, Ed Harris, Tommy, Tommy Gary, Gary, they're all really good actors. Dennis, Dennis Bob, yeah. all these people, but they're all complicated people, really good actors. And, and they have and, demons, and, but then at the same and, time, they, exactly, they, they, exactly. You know? Yeah. And I love that. Okay. And you know what? It's funny you say it because these, these those kind of actors they don't exist anymore. I we're losing them. We're, you know, we're losing them. There's just all, yeah. it's just pretty faces now. There's no there's no um, story behind them. It's just very blank yeah, and superficial. We're we're losing them. I I don't think we have um, personally. I don't think we have very many memorable actors anymore. I mean. He, 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 they they all are, I call them cookie cutter actors. They all they all look and sound alike to me now. Just rubber no, plastic, no. you know, plastic. Just, y yeah, just fake, you know. Yeah, but to to give you an example, like I was doing this because I worked um, after Mohicans and after learning my lesson with Gary Oldman. <laughs> after Mohicans, Madeline Stowe asked me to be her personal, and she put me in her contract for a while. Um, and gave me first refusal just about on everything she did. Um, so we ended up doing three, total of three movies together. Madeline unlawful Entry? Huh? Did you do Unlawful Entry? No, I did. No. We did Mohicans, no. Blink, which we just lost, Michael Apted, who directed Blink, who I love, Michael Apted too, another great director we just lost. Um, I did Mohicans, Blink, and The Proposition with Madeline. That's a Western, and, right? No. What's that? Uh, there's a there is a western called Proposition. Yeah, I was gonna this, say that, that, this, this is, is another one. It's a different film. It's completely yeah, different film. Um, when we did this was uh, time period 1930s. It's actually a really nice, good movie. Great cast, and that's what my point was. I was getting to um, was it was Madeline, uh, um, 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 William Hurt, um, um, Blythe Dana. Um, um, Kenneth Branagh. Oh, wow. Now, <clears throat> all of them are wonderful, but style-wise, watching them on set together was fascinating to me. Phenomenal. Because William Hurt was very much on the line of all the actors and people I was talking about before. They were very in, you know, into it, rough on themselves, and almost almost method, okay? Which I understand, and I, I can deal with that. A lot of people can't deal with that. I can that's William, very, uh, Kenneth, who I thought would be that way, especially his background being, you know, all the Shakespeare and all the, uh, his training. I thought Kenneth would be, you know, very much into that method kind of, no, Kenneth is one of the biggest jokesters you'll ever find to the point of when we're on set together, uh, you know, William Hurts over in the corner trying to pull up his, you know, emotions and stuff. And Kenneth is like, eh, 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 eh. action pull right into it. You know, it's amazing to watch. He can it switch it. A, he can switch yeah, it like that. Just like, yeah, just like that. Most actors can't do that. <laughs> you know, um, Anthony amazing. Hopkins, Anthony Hopkins is like that as well. He, um, I, I've never, I've, yeah. I've, unfortunately, I've never worked with him or met him. Um, I mean, I've been told by people who've worked with him that yeah. he, um, it's not method in any way, you know, not like you'd think. He just knows the script. He jokes. He can joke around. And then the moment he jokes, the moment the camera's on, he's into it. Yeah. You know? Oh, speaking you know? of which, you said you might go back and watch it tonight. Keep this in mind while you're watching Manhunter. 
Yeah. Tom Noonan. The bad guy. Yeah. Who yeah. played Dollarhide. Total method actor. He was creepy in that film. He was total method. You could not refer to him at all as Tom. You always had to refer to him as Dollarhide. Francis. Francis. He was always in character. Always. And yes, you're right. He was creepy and scary. And even in real life, he was because he didn't come out of that character. Terrifying. So, so scary. <laughs> so weird. I, I yeah. joke. I joke that the Wilmington Police Department needs to look into unsolved murders <laughs> in 1985 here because I swear to God, it wouldn't put it past. I swear. I. He was freaky, though. The character. <laughs> he's. Uh, yeah, I mean, he. he um, he was in Heat. He worked with Michael yeah. again on Heat as well. So yeah, uh, yeah. he no. pops up and stuff quite a bit. You'll see. Him. He still works. He pops up and stuff. But to me, no other performance he's ever done comes close to what he did. That was fucking that scary, wasn't it? He yeah. he did a really yeah. really great job in that. Too fairy. The two but fairy, but it was it? a but it was scary to be around him because he yeah. he was he was constantly he he never broke character. He was always in character. Yeah, that's scary. It's very yeah. scary, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. I mean, when he gets the, uh, I remember when he gets the journalist and he's, yep. he's, he's got that, he's got that thing around in his face. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Bizarre. So bizarre. And just, uh, yep. uh, and I can, I think because it's, it's realistic as well. That's what's, there's people like it. That's what's scary. Exactly. There, 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 there's, uh, it, you know, there's psycho, you know, it's, Exactly. Well, that's one of the things that's kind of been fun for me looking back now over the years. Um, because like I said, when I was a kid, I was always attracted to the monsters and the monster movies and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, got, you know, intrigued by the, you know, makeup effects. But then as I got into it and as I taught people too I, I i tell my students you know everybody gets interested in makeup because of the effects but you got to learn you know regular makeup before you can do effects properly and most people don't want to do that and don't understand that you have to do that for it to really work and i said but look at it this way every look at it as like um every film Every TV show, every commercial, everything needs makeup. Not every show, not every commercial, not every movie needs special effects makeup. So look at special effects makeup like dessert. You don't always get it, but when you get it, enjoy it. <laughs> but to make a living and a career, you need to know how to do regular, or we call straight makeup. makeup because that's where you make your living. But now looking back at my career, I've actually created some of, or helped create, some of the most horrifying monsters in cinema history now that are human beings. Realistic. Frank real, Booth. Real. Yeah. Frank Booth. Uh, Dollarhide. Francis Dollarhide. Uh, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, you want to get even crazier? Uh, Magua, Last of Mohicans, Shredder, Turtles. Oh, Ninja Turtles, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've done some of the most iconic, kind of like human monsters, really, in cinema, cinema history. history. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just, so, just, uh, that's, it's amazing. I mean, uh, and you're still working as well, which is. Fantastic. Yeah, getting ready to do uh, Scream. We, Scream. Well, Scream. We we already shot that. That's done. Um, we we and and went surprisingly well because that was we shot that uh, during all the COVID stuff. We we started shooting. We did that. We started late August, and we wrapped Scream right before Thanksgiving. So at the end of November is when we finished Scream. And now we're starting the Black Phone, which I think they're changing the title to Static, which I kind of like Static better as a title for this. 
Um, it's based upon a Joe Hill short story called The Black Phone. Um, Joe Hill, if you're not familiar with Joe Hill, Joe Hill is a writer, but Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. Oh, okay. Um, Stephen, I know really well. Stephen King and I have worked together, good God, how many, seven or eight now? I can't, I, I lost count. Steve, I've known Stephen since the early 80s. Great, great guy. Um, so Joe Hill wrote Black Phone, which we were getting ready to do. Um, it's being directed by S Scott Derrickson. Oh, yeah, yeah. He did Hellraiser Inferno. And he did um, Last Exorcism of Emily Rose and, and uh, The Day yeah. the Earth Stood Still. And, yeah. And, and Doctor Strange as well. Yeah. Yeah, Doctor Strange and Sinister. Yeah. Sinister. Yeah. Um, he's directing um, and he's, he's a tough nut. <laughs> he's a tough nut to crack. We hadn't cracked him yet. Um, he's a strange one. He seems to know what he wants, but he won't tell anybody. <laughs> so there's no communication. <laughs> no, hardly any communication. That's like yesterday when you called, we were actually on a Zoom meeting with him <laughs> yesterday, and it's like it's like pulling teeth to get any. We need to know to to give you an example. Um, now you can't use. I mean, I don't know if, what you plan on. Uh, don't, you don't have to say it. I mean, uh, it's a recording, but you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. So, uh, well, I mean, but, yeah. but what I'm getting ready to say can't really be out there. Oh, um, hang on. Wait, let me. Let me um... Everybody's not really going that broke that I know because we're not spending money right now because there's nothing to do. No, absolutely. I mean, it's like, um, I'll tell you what, Jeff, that's why um, I uh, decided to um, do the books because I had all the time. Yep. And, yeah. I had, um, I could speak perfect to people. Yeah, perfect, perfect time, time yeah. To do that. I yeah. mean, that's, um, so the first book is War is Hell, The Making of Hell is a Tree, Head on Earth, and that should yeah. be out soon, you know, like probably February or March or later on in the year. And I'm, cool. I'm, I'm working, my second book is about The Mask, uh, the Jim Carrey film, The Mask. Oh, The Mask, yes, yeah. 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 And I've spoken to cool. 31 people I've spoken to. Um, probably a lot of people, you know, like Greg, Ka I haven't, I'm, a lot of makeup, uh, the visual yeah. effects, visual effects guys, the director, yeah. Chuck Russell. Um, yeah. Yeah, Greg, and Greg Cowan's a great guy. Yeah. I've tried to get hold of him, but I can't, I just ha I can't get hold of him. Um, I've emailed him. I've, I've done everything. I just, maybe just, maybe he's just not interested. He's a little, I, I, I shared a makeup room with him, um, briefly. Um, he's, he's, he's kind of shy. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, he, good guy. Um, he uh he was doing i was doing teen, the original teenage mutant ninja turtles and he was doing the exorcist three and we shared a makeup room for a little while together um uh, i liked him but yeah he's a little he's a, a little, little shy no yeah, so I, I i didn't bother him anymore because i thought you know i just he decided kind of yeah. semi-retired um, retired, yeah. then we got an oscar you know uh nomination or did he win it last year or recently recently he kind of brought, yeah. him out, brought, brought him out a little bit of of kind of a he got nominated for the mask i know that as well so that was uh, well he's won a couple he's won a couple of oscars right. had quite he's had well he's worked on a lot he's had quite a career as well hasn't he so he's uh, yeah no, he's, he's won a couple of oscars yeah. he's a good guy but then like uh, i've spoken to a lot of the ilm guys and the dream quest guys and yeah. th these guys like worked on terminator 2 and jurassic park and so yeah. they were, they've been around since you've been around. So it's interesting, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone's sort of, you know, all these people are just working still. Some, most people aren't working. Most people are just, uh, they are, but there's lockdowns or LA, Los Angeles, there's, you know, um, you know, everyone's stopping and starting, aren't they? With productions and depending on lockdowns and stuff, you know? Well, the, yeah. the weird Here's a weird thing that I did, I wasn't that aware of until I actually started working, and um, East Coast West Coast here way of working in film completely different, completely different, um, and it's something that I, I I really wasn't like I said aware of that much until I actually started. Um, to give you an example, 
what I'm talking about. Almost all the films I've done, and now I think I'm up to 131. I think this new one that we're starting is my 131st film. Um, with a few exceptions, I've done the entire film of all of those. West Coast, hardly anybody does a movie from beginning to end. Hmm. They do bits. Bits. They do. They have day checkers and day players, and and it's a totally different system. And the first time I worked in L.A. was in 1987 uh, on Rambo. Free Rambo, free. Yeah. 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 And the guys out there were in shock. And I was still fairly young. Oh, I, was, I was young then. It was 87. Um, and the guys were shocked. And that was, uh, hadn't even done, you know, half of what I've done now, of course, then. But they were all in shock that I had done so many films and had done the entire film. Because none of them had done an entire film. And, and most of the guys that were with me on that were old enough to be my father and resumes as long as your arm, but so, they had never done a complete uh, film. You, you, uh, you, you outdid them. <laughs> and they yeah. just were like, they couldn't understand that mentality or the, the fact that that's how we work here. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different vibe. It's a completely different, different, different way. Different way. Different way. Yeah. yeah. No, it's uh... It's, 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 it's been an absolute pleasure, by the way, um, uh, talking. You know, it's been an absolute... Um, We're well, easy to talk with. I, I love talking movies, as you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm you're not, very easy to talk to. Oh, thank you. And I think because prior to the... when we Before we had the Zoom, we had a chat, which was quite nice, I think. And yeah. We, un, we could understand each other a lot. So it was... Um, yeah. I think... Uh, and without getting, you know, argumentative or there was no... Uh, issue and it's so easy to talk to, so easy to talk to because I bet you were quite surprised and because all the stuff I've been posting has been interesting and, um, uh, you've been posting like I said you've been posting stuff that I've never seen before I'm, I've really been enjoying a lot I'm gonna, of stuff I, and I'm gonna get more I'll, I'll keep posting more so you can um, cool there's cool. a lot of stuff there's a, there's a brilliant one I've got um with David talking about um velvet and he uh he does mention how long he had the script for and the other he had mentioned i think as well the, the, the two scripts that he hadn't done yet so um one, one saliva bubble and uh and the, midget, rocket. Uh, and the midget one yeah no, yeah probably, ronnie rocket yeah because i'm guessing it's i still real. i still would love to see him get both those films made um uh, I, I hope he does because i'd, l I'd like to see them <laughs> he's uh but he does come back to these things you know because if you look yeah. he, he came back to twin peaks and he had timed that perfectly because he'd done he did like it was 25 years after the fact that he said it in twin peaks yeah so he did do a third season and he's very uh straight you know he does all these things for a reason so um yeah he is no i i, I love i mean i've never worked with him or seen him to be quite honest never worked with him again or never saw him again after blue bell which is a shame um um same with kyle and isabella and laura Dennis and I worked together uh, several times, like I said. Um, Dean Stockwell and I worked together several times. Oh, Dean, yeah. He was a child actor, right? Yes. Was he he yeah, was yeah, yeah. Boy, boy with green hair. That was Dean, yeah. Uh, he's another great guy. That's actually, to be honest, that's actually my favorite thing I've ever done. That was, um, that was your the favorite. Character of ben, the character of Ben in Blue Velvet, my favorite thing I've ever done. Because that's that's not in the script. No, 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 that's really in the script. There was a scene written where they go to Ben's place and get the beer, and they do the they have the dialogue, but it's, there was no description of Ben in this in the script at all. Uh, the whole candy colored clown with the they work light, the on, yeah, that all came about because of rehearsal and what they found in the ideas and ideas yeah, came that, that, and, all was born yeah. that night it was just one night of shooting that with dean we just had dean the one one night to shoot all his stuff and we dean stockwell and i created 
the characters been together in the makeup trailer, the whole look and everything. And still to this day, it's my favorite thing I've ever done. It's, it was it was fun. And uh, also you had uh, Brad Dorf. Brad Dorf, oh, yeah. a wonderful actor. Wonderful he was actor. in it as well, even though he had a little, he was small, but he had a, he had a role in it, you know? He had Raymond, a, yeah, Raymond. Yeah. This Come on, let's take, you want to take a joy ride? Let's take a joy, yeah. yeah. Let's Thank hit you, the Raymond. fucking roll. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. fun story, which I, I'm pretty sure it's in my book. Um, the fun story with Brad Dorif uh, from Blue Velvet is, uh, like I said, he in a small role, didn't have much to do. So good, especially good actors, which he is. He's a great actor. I mean, good God, Billy Bobbitt in One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest Alone. <laughs> And, and the, uh, I, um, voice Chucky, you know? Yeah, you know? Chucky was Chucky. Um, so there's a sequence in Blue Velvet where they go, well, when they go to Ben's place, okay? Um, and that whole sequence, and um, have Isabella go talk to her son, which you never see, but the son's hidden in that back room that she goes and talks to the son, her son. And there's a, there's a sequence where uh, when Isabella goes into the the room to talk to her son and Dennis Hopper and, and, and uh, uh, Dean have their exchange with the money and the drugs and everybody in the room is kind of like dancing around and doing a thing. And you see Brad Dorif, I think he's up on the couch actually dancing around and you see he's got something in his hand. You can't really tell what it is. He's actually got a dead snake that he found in the gutter outside of the location where we were shooting. And so he stuck it in his pocket and put it in his coat pocket. And then in the scene pulls it out and is dancing around playing with this dead snake. Not in the script, not anything. It's just something he did. As and part of and the it's craziness. probably not even noticeable, but you, it's there. It's there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so funny thing is, end of the night, we wrap the, you know, we finish, we wrap up. All the costumes goes, you know, everything's returned and everything. So, Long story short, costume truck, week later, they start going, what is smelling so awful? What is, what is that horrible smell? Nobody could figure out what was going on. Nobody knew that that dead snake was still in Brad Dorff's pocket uh, of his coat that had been hanging in the trailer now for over a week, rotting. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that must have uh, really smelled. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. But now, the sad thing, too, though, about Blue Velvet is how many, how many people there, cast-wise and crew, we've lost. I mean, we, there's not that Passed many away. of us. Passed not away. many of us left. Yeah. So... I mean, David, David is, uh, I mean, David, he's getting on now, isn't he? David must be. He just turned 75 yesterday. He just, yeah, I posted it up. Yeah, he's, I posted it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 75, was, I think, yesterday. Yeah. He was, it was uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah, I did post it up. So it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. But he's still, I suppose that's still like, he's still got time to make those films. Yeah, I think but, he can still, yeah. he can still do some stuff. I worked with um, his daughter. Uh, Jennifer, who's a wonderful director in her own right. And uh, we worked together. Uh, well, she actually was with us um, as a PA on Blue, on Blue Velvet when we first started. But we started in the summer of 1984. Um, no, sorry. Su summer of 1985 is when we started shooting Blue Velvet. So once the summer was over, she, she, wasn't able to finish the movie with us because she had to go back home to go to high school. She was still in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then I didn't see her again until we did this show called South of Hell for Eli Roth a few years back. Not a good show, by the way, no, no, but no. we had a fun, but we had fun doing it. Um, and it was a, a series and Jennifer came in and directed two of the episodes and actually acted as well in, in the show and loved her, loved her. And she recognized me right off the bat. In fact, I got out of, tr out of the van one day. Um, we were, it was a series, so we were shooting, and she came in 
to direct her thing. And I didn't know she was there yet. And I get out of the van and I am literally broadsided, tackle. And she goes, got to make the ear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a blast together. She, she's great. And she's, she, she's a lot of fun. She and her dad are the same in some respects. But uh, different in other ways. But totally different in other ways. But the thing that they both have, which is wonderful about them, is they make everybody feel uh, comfortable and like the set is where you want to be. And that's, that's a good quality. That's to have an important them. thing. That's an important thing. Yeah. Um, so, and what, what was your, um, I mean, when did you, when did you see people? Did you like the premiere or what was your reaction? And, I um, didn't get this. No, there really wasn't a premiere for us or anything. Um, and the whole releasing of that film was actually kind of strange. Um, no studio would touch it. Dino couldn't, Dino couldn't get the film released. Um, the producer, the UPM producer, who's still a friend of mine, who I've done tons of stuff with over the years, including Mario Brothers, same guy, uh, Fred Caruso, wonderful. Look up Fred's credits. Good God almighty, you want to cry. Unbelievable. Uh, Fred, Fred, Fred did uh, Midnight Cowboy, Godfather. Wow. I mean, I could God go on mighty. and on with Fred. Fred's he, he must have won an Oscars then. My God Almighty! He no, he hasn't. No, really? it doesn't um, matter. It doesn't Fred, matter. Do you know what? It doesn't matter. It's the work being done. It's the main. Well, thing. That's, that's that's what I mean. I, I'm not trying to sound egotistical, but that's that's what me and my guys always, still to this day, say. We let our work speak for itself. Like your work, it doesn't need any awards. What you've done is amazing. I mean, that's I I, I feel very fortunate that I've had now a 41 year run still going but 41 years now but like i said i feel very fortunate that i've been a part of projects that stand the test of time and are actually good movies and that is something i'm proud of um so that that's a good thing um i've had a good run <laughs> But what was your reaction anyway? What, what did you... Um, well, okay, yeah, I, I didn't get to see... Um, so, when, uh, right before the film came out, Fred, Fred Caruso called me up. And you got to understand our relationship is... It's, so, Fred calls me up and says, I don't know whether to kiss you or slap you. And I go, uh -oh, what's going on, Fred? He goes, they want to give Blue Velvet an X. And it's not for the sex, it's for all your shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. For the year. <laughs> for, for all the yeah, violence. Violence, cool. yeah. yeah. And so I said, I'll, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. So they had to cut, they had to cut seconds and little, they had to make little cuts to get the uh, R rating. Um, and like I said, it was mainly because of the, the, the gore and the violence that they had qualms with so when blue velvet came out um it was the first uh release from deg de Laurentiis entertainment group dino had to actually make his own distribution company to release the film because no studio would release would it would touch it no no studio would touch it huh no studio would touch it no, they no studio it. would touch it yeah they saw it as dangerous I guess. yeah yeah um so it did not get a wide opening originally and it never played here at all originally when it first came out. I had to actually uh, drive from, I'm, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. I had to drive for the first time to see it to Washington DC in the day Christ. to actually see it in the theater. How long that take? To get to um, it's about a nine hour drive. Jesus. Yeah. Um, did you stay there then? Did you stay there? I'm guessing. Did you stay there for a night, or did you? Oh yeah, you, yeah, yeah. In a hotel? Yeah, just, did you have to stay in a hotel? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just just drove up, watched the movie, and stayed overnight, and came back. Yeah, because um, uh, yeah, it, it didn't even play here. Uh, I loved the film when I saw it. Um, it was um, there were some changes, of course, as far as the way it was cut, um, because this the the original script. Uh, and the, the film now 
the the timeline has been rearranged and so the cut's different it works i love it but it was uh yeah it's, it it was different <laughs> but uh no, I, I like the film and still like the film. It's, it's my favorite. I've got three films that are my favorites that I've been a part of and done, which are Blue Velvet, Last of the Mohicans, and Ang Lee's Ride with the Devil. Those are my three films that I, if I never do another film, so, I'm okay. You're okay because what you've I, done. I, I like, you've I think achieved. those are you've achieved. Good, good films that stand the test of time are good movies. Absolutely, and then absolutely. You, and then you throw in like a lot of people nowadays like we said Mario Brothers uh, Teenage Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Ninja yeah um, and crazy enough another film that I did that people go nuts for is a film called Empire Records um, people go crazy for that film that has a cult following here um, in fact uh, Michelle Dockery a few years ago, I was doing a pilot. Um, Michelle Dockery, who's in uh, Downton Abbey. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I was doing a pilot with her uh, called uh, Good Behavior. And we were shooting. I'd been shooting for a couple weeks. And she found out while we were shooting that I did Empire Records. I've never seen anyone go as crazy as this lady went when she found out I did that movie, was literally screaming on set, jumping up and down and then come over and hugging me. Like she couldn't believe that I did that film. And when her sister came to visit, the first thing she did that day that her sister came to visit, wasn't go see, say hello to the director. She brought her sister right to me. This is the guy I'll tell you, he did it by record. And I, ah! Because they used to dress up like the characters when they were kids. That's unbelievable, isn't it? That just tells so you. People, the cult. people go crazy for that movie. Yeah. I mean, um, do you know what? I'm, Jeff, I'm surprised with your um, Blue Velvet book. I'm surprised you don't do like conventions and stuff because that could help. Um, Convention things. You know. uh, well, now with COVID. They're oh, no, but out of the question. Yeah. But I mean, like, even, but it's, even, you know. even before COVID, the convention circuit, I don't know. How it not is fan. but yeah. here it's it's pretty weird and tight i can't get info as to how to get into that kind of circuit or, or 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 gig uh as far as these conventions go everybody's really tight-lipped about it and is weird so i have no idea how to even get into that circuit if i um know of anything, i think it, i think it'd be a blast to do i would love it but. i think because i mean I mean, do you come over here much or do you come to the UK much or not really? Or? Not since I moved back to the States when I was in, in living in Italy, we used to come over to England quite a bit, my son and I. Um, but it, since I moved back over here. Because it's a shame because, you know, if, if I know of any, because if I can help in any way, then I, you know, they might know some people that can, well, I mean, when this thing goes, gets better or Yeah, well, I mean, keep, keep me in mind yeah. and, and you know, in the future. Because the thing is, like, if um, you hear of anything, you know, because the thing know. is, like, because you worked on, like, Blue Velvet and yeah. book, you got a book and that could help. You know, I mean, you could sell some copies for yourself. And, well, the you thing, know, too, that the thing that um, I've done. Well, Q&As, you could do Q&As, you know. You could talk well, about yeah, I, that, I, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. The thing I've done several times at different museums, which has always been nice, um, I actually still have the original ears. Wow. And, and I still have all the original stuff that I made for the film. I still have everything. Um, and so Mr. Ear makes appearances uh, at different museums. Um, he, 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 um, he appeared at the Museum of Moving Images in New York for a while. He was in the uh, Raleigh State Museum here for a wonderful exhibit they did for almost a year on the history of uh, movies in North Carolina. Uh, and I don't know, he's about four or five different museums that he's had been in exhibits and stuff. Um, and so yeah, I go and I speak and that kind of stuff for these museum things. Uh, and that's always fun. Um, so the fact that I still have the year itself is a huge draw. 
and I joke, I, I say sometimes when I get invited to do some of these talks and things, it's like, you don't really want me. You just want, you just want the ear. <laughs> so, <laughs> so keep that in mind. So yeah, no. I, I still got all the stuff. Well, because, um, you know, we, we there's a couple of um, festivals here or sort of, I don't know, like horror festivals or this thing called Fright Fest. And I'm sure that, I mean, when things get back, they, they, they would like, that would be interesting. They could get you to go there and talk about Blue Velvet. And, yeah. Because Blue Velvet's kind of got horror elements to it. So it's not. Oh, yeah. Really yeah, nice. it does. Yeah. So, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a, it, to me, it's a hard movie to put into a category. Like most of David's films, you can't really. Uh, yeah. Rock now, another movie. thing that we did, um, so you know, um, that was actually Patricia Norris and myself and unfortunately patricia norris is no longer with us either patricia was patricia was david's um, um she did almost all i think she might have done all of them um she was production designer and costume designer um I, she'd been with david since elephant man i know that i love the elephant man to me the elephant man, to me to me the elephant man is john a, hurt john hurt john hurt yeah I got to have lunch. I got to meet and have lunch with John Hurt one day, which was a thrill for me because I've always loved his work. But to me, The Elephant Man is a flawless film. To me, it is a beautiful Mossy. movie. Absolutely gorgeous all the way around. But on Blue Velvet, it was actually Patricia, my idea, and we got David to go along with it. And I, I'm glad we did because this goes back to kind of what you and I were talking about a little bit, I think uh, yesterday about how um, sometimes eighties movies don't hold up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why to me they don't hold up is unfortunately because of hair, makeup and wardrobe. Cause if you look at them, they, it just dates them so much. You can see that it's from another you, time, another you, era. Yeah. Yeah. So what we proposed to David, which we did with blue velvet was mix up the timeline. Don't put a stamp date on it. We had elements of 50s. We had elements of 60s, 70s, 80s. We had all these different elements so that the time timeless, frame timeless. Is kind of, timeless. gives it a timeless feel. And to me, that helps that film have legs and still stand up today because you go back and look at Blue Velvet and it's not as dated as most of your 80s it's, movies, I think because of that reason. It's the costuming. It's, it's the look. Yeah. It doesn't, it just... Uh... Costumes, the cars, the locations, everything was Cinematog mixed up on cinematography the on purpose or oh, fred uh, elms you know, was my yeah yeah i mean cinematographer fred cinematog uh, he, he's one of my favorites he I, I got to work again with fred elms on the ang lee film he shot ride with the devil as well uh and i love he's my favorite dp i i i, I love his work love his work i mean the way it's shot is just uh, well i mean i still genius. say that he gave he gave laura dern the most beautiful, beautiful entrance, entrance in a film I think I've ever seen with the lighting of her coming out of the shadow darkness the with the swell of the music. And in that beautiful light, it's like, how can you get a better entrance into a movie than that? You can't, that was just like beautiful. Magical. Just a magical, yep. you know, just yep. uh, part of the movie. very, very good DP. Yeah, no, it's uh, no, I'm definitely going to get that book, <laughs> whether it be ebook. Uh, I'm definitely, I'll get both if I can. Um, but for the moment, I'll probably get the ebook because of the COVID thing, and that way I can have a look at the pictures, which is a, yeah, what I'd like to um, do. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it, I've really enjoyed uh, chatting, and um, I'll, fun, uh, man. yeah, no, I'll post this link up because uh, I'll post this up. Um, I cut out the bits that I, but well, it's already gone. The stuff that we were talking about, but it's, okay, that, that warning, you know, like what, what it, it's been. I paused it so. And then after okay. after some time, I would put it back on. So it's all right. Thank so, you. I appreciate. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Because I know I know what it's like. Because I mentioned some stuff that I couldn't mention as well. So oh, uh, if that if that yeah. if they saw that right now, I I I'd, I'd be fired. Like I said, yeah. It's, yeah, it's because you sign stuff, and I do the same. Yeah. Um, I you sign something, and you can't you can't yeah. you're sworn to it. And, yeah, like I said, until it, until yeah. it comes out, we can't talk about it until it no, comes out. No, I mean even. There's stuff I've done I can't even I'm not even even allowed to say anything and 
it's yeah. like I, I could be liable for you know oh yeah you know a lot Plus, so, that's uh, like right right now to a screen i no. can't tell you no anything much no. about no. you know that yet because i mean <laughs> yeah i mean it's best just to sort of wait till when it comes out so yeah yeah, looking, yeah. so uh, but yeah. yeah it's uh really uh we'll stay in touch and um yeah keep keep uh, i'll post this up and uh people can watch it as well so you can share it and people can cool. maybe uh have an interest in your book and your work and you'll cool. probably get a whole bunch of people like wanting to chat to you going probably do that because there's a few i'm friends with and they'll be probably bound to say oh we'll have to get you at a convention or or something and, or some q a or it. you know I'd, so, I'd, I'd love it to keep keep know. me mine i'd love it yeah yeah because because especially um they could do a screening Blue yeah. imagine if they could get uh well not i don't think they would but they got like david there and what they got um you know they wouldn't be able to get Laura Dern for sure, but they could get uh, maybe Kyle would be because Kyle's not really. I would love to see Kyle again. I would love to see Kyle. I had such a great time with all of them. I, I, we had such a great time, and we were actually very, we all got really close too because at that time there really wasn't much to do here in Wilmington. It's a very small town, and it's that time it really wasn't much to do at all. And so we literally would have game nights and stuff over at my house. And they stayed over with me quite a bit, and we had we had a blast. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun, and we were all young. We were all young, all young. You know? yeah. And it was it's, it was so much fun. It's funny because uh, you know Carl worked on Doom, and then he worked Blue Velvet, and then he worked Twin Peaks, and uh, yeah, I mean he he continues to work. So you know, oh yeah, you know, it's, yep. uh, and Laura as well. Uh, yep. she's uh, still working. I've seen. Well, she won an Oscar. Yeah, and she's working on big. She works on big films, and small yeah, films. She just won. She just won an Oscar. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, her dad as well. Her dad, obviously, is uh, quite a legend as well. Bruce Stern. Her dad. Her, yeah. her dad and her mom. Yeah, her parents. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yep. so you know, it's like a family thing. You know. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll stay in touch, and I've, I've really, uh, I, hope you've, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. You know, because, uh, I did, um, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I did. It was fun. And I hope yeah. your son, hope your son's okay as well. And, yeah, he's doing yeah. good. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, um, you guys, you all stay safe. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, my my, I think my, you know, mum and dad are all good, and sisters okay, and uh, everyone's yeah. It's just just keep safe, stay in, and yeah, exactly. watch movies, watch movies, right. I think yep. what's great about this is that I can talk to people like yourself and uh, it's good to talk about because now you can reflect on things and yeah. archive things is important, I think, to archive yeah. um, because you'll be surprised, like you say, you know, like, so you worked on that Empire, uh, Empire Records, was it? Empire yeah, Records? Yeah, em- Empire Records. Yeah. Empire Records. And then people, or Super Mario Brothers, and these people go, wow, you worked on it. Oh my God, you know, and then so they're, People want to know, so it's um, it's uh, your work has uh, affected, you know, obviously hit a nerve with some people. So uh, and they and the fact that that um, some people might not know that, but when they do, they they be like, wow, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly interesting. Yeah, and I never knew about the book. That's what that's what interests me now because that's like uh, that's an encyclopedia, I bet. You know. Like I said, it was it was fun to do because, like I said, it was it's my love letter to the film, and I really like I said I, I really wanted people to see once you see some of the photos that as a dark uh, film and and we were we were having fun making it. You know, it was it's an absolute like, joke. It was absolute even the ser- even though how matter how serious it was, it really was just like yeah, it's not yeah. real. It's a movie. It's, it's a not movie. real. It's not real. <laughs> yeah. But but, it, um, but that's yeah. one of the, but that you're talking about, you know, possibly having like a screening. That's actually something I get a kick out of. And you'll, you'll appreciate this and understand what I'm talking about. I, I do get invited and I have done quite a bit of screenings of blue velvet. Recently we just did one for Mohicans, which was nice because usually it is blue velvet. Um, but something that I'm actually proud of is still to this day when we do screenings of blue velvet, never fails we'll have at least two or three walkouts during the screening because it's too much for people i love that 
because the reaction it shows that yeah. it shows that it's still got a punch. It's still doing its job. Because <laughs> that's what happened when it was released. You know, there was walkouts because yeah. But then um, it still happens, and I and it still love happens. that. And you know what? As well, um, is that there's so the people who people who misunderstood the film then go back to it and go, "Wow, that was I missed the point." So you know, like there was loads of critics that at the time just did just uh, you know trashed it or just felt it oh, was too Ro much. Famous Roger, Roger Roger Ebert. Roger Ebert, right? And then he went yeah, back and said, actually it was, accused actually accused Lynch of of uh, of uh, you know uh, harming Isabella and abuse and all that. Nothing could be farther than the truth. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They opposite. actually felt they were laughing. I mean, even film. Dennis was like, I've seen the documentary, and even Dennis was. He made it comfortable for her when they were doing that scene. Yes, I mean it was. Even though it was and, horrendous, but it, they were laugh that like he they were like completely just. He made it comfortable oh, for her. Dennis wasn't it, um, being, uh, you know, he was no trouble at all. Even though no, it was a, it was a, it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to be a part of. It was amazing things to watch. Mm -hmm. But the thing that most people don't realize though about that is, like I said, we were shooting the film already you know, when Dennis was, you know, cast. And then Bob. So mm -hmm. when he came on board, the first scene, the first thing we ever did with Dennis Hopper was his introduction. And that scene where he rapes Isabella right off the bat. Boom. Hello. This is the first thing we do. Now think about that though, as far as poor Isabella, that's her introduction to this man. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's uh, and to do that, to especially yeah. you know, there hadn't really been anything like that, so it was uh, yeah. I mean, everybody talks uh, about the the movie, which I you know agree, but something that I don't think is talked about enough actually is Isabella's performance because amazing. how amazing it was, but also how brave it was. Brave. Yeah, I mean, it, it, she's giving. I, it, I, mean, I I still to this day like bow down to her for that reason because. She, when we made that film, okay, she was one of the top paid models in the world. She was the face of Lancome Cosmetics and was huge as far as that goes. Uh, she was actually really worried that this was going to destroy her image, all of that. Hmm. And it could have, you know, but it didn't. And, and she, I, I don't think enough credit's given to her because that was a very, very brave brave performance totally it totally was it was yeah it was just uh it was just yeah it really i'm just, it's just yeah just amazing screen acting yep you know just i think everyone in that film is great you know yeah it's a magical movie you know it's yep one of a kind. kind. One of a kind. Yeah. A, a, a one of a kind. It's actually one of the things I'm. I'm actually kind of happy about too because it's something we joke about a lot all of us that work together in our little group is the fact that we're hollywood keeps of course and this this goes back to the days of silent movies hollywood is all they do is remake everything they regurgitate say, regurgitate the same old yeah formula. i mean yeah paul schrader i think said it best one time he says hollywood wants the same wine and just a different bottle <laughs> and i think that's exactly it so I've, I feel very confident that of all the stuff I've done, Blue Velvet's the one that will never be remade because it just can't. Yeah, it's like uh, I suppose the difference between Coke and Diet Coke, you know. You know yeah. Uh, you know, you know, it's uh, yeah. It's, uh, one's got more sugar in, the other one's got caffeine, and, and you know, I suppose uh, I suppose um, Blue Velvet has the kick, has the sugar kick, and <laughs> you know it's uh yep. you know it's, it's it's like uh yeah it's it's got a lot of sugar and then uh it's got the kick that yeah you just you just can't take it away you can't, nope. you can't um i don't think you could repeat what was done so uh no it's just too it was just of its time and it's just you can't you, can, you can't remake it it's just you couldn't they they wouldn't be the actors wouldn't do that now there would be there's no, no actors like is it, there would be nothing like what Isabella did. There, no. how, what actresses today would do what she did? No one would be brave to do that. 
Dennis. There, there's no one like. There's no one like Dennis. There, there will be no one like Dennis Hopper ever again. He wouldn't be allowed on a film set anymore. Someone no. like that. Not. Uh, he's not. Blue, not Blue Velvet actually was his first film after rehab, clean and sober, yeah. and it was actually an amazing thing to watch, because it was like watching a child see stuff for the first time. It really was. It was watching Dennis at that time was was amazing because like i said everything was new to him and it was it was a pleasure to 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 be a part of that because and something that people don't know which i think people need to know it was dennis i'm even getting a little emotional even think about this now it was dennis and dean stockwell that literally put him physically on the plane and paid for Jack Nance's rehab at the end of Blue Velvet. Wow. That's yep. yep. They got him cleaned up. So it was, it was a great thing to see. What does that, what does that tell you? Um, does that, I mean, that, that tells you, you know, it's a human being. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's not many people know that, you know, so it's, um, no. yeah. You know, probably, they probably say, well, he's just drunk and he's, they, not many people see it. Well, he's just acting. He's just giving a performance. You know, it's not. He's not. He's not on drugs. He's he's playing the part. He's a yeah. terrific actor. He's you know he's amazing. You know. So it's yeah. like. Uh, no, but he's but sad because to, to give like to give you an example, I. You know, we, like I said, we worked together a lot over the years. Not just the two movies, but we did tons of photo shoots and stuff together over the years. And we would talk all the time. And I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm like you, I'm a huge movie buff to begin with. I love movies. That's why I do what I do. And one of my all-time favorite movies still to this day is Apocalypse Now. So I wanted to talk to Dennis about Apocalypse Now. He didn't remember it. Because he was completely out of his mind. He, I mean, we talked. He, he, he flat out told me, he says, I don't remember much at all of that. And I'm like, how sad is that? I mean, think about that. That's that's incredibly sad to me. That you know, you're part of to me still one of the best movies ever made, and you don't even remember it. You know, that just yeah, you know, it's. I remember I saw mean, the um, the Heart of Darkness documentary, and uh, oh, great, that's a great and, documentary. Um, it, you know, you see him on that, and he's completely out of his mind. You know, what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's like, you know, I wish I could have wish he. I wish I could. Shame, you know, that I can just watch his films, but um, you know, I mean, uh, it's sad that he uh, passed away, you know. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember, he, I remember Michael telling me that uh, Michael Madsen telling me, you know, um, the only way up, the only way they'll give me a Hollywood, uh, my walk of fame man is if I'm dying of cancer, man. And then that's what happened, you know, he got cancer and then he um, got his foot and hand print. In yep. the uh, Wolf of Fame, but you know what? He didn't need that anyway because his work says yep. it all anyway. You know, um, I mean, Easy Rider and oh, Easy Rider's still oh. incredible, incredible, powerful. They wouldn't film. make, they wouldn't get made today. Wouldn't who would make no. that? You know? you know. Well, that's that's still my favorite time of movies for me. The movies of the late '60s, early to mid '70s, to me. In my opinion, that's when some of the best cinema was came out. In my opinion, and still stuff today that still most of those films, in my opinion, still hold up and are very powerful. And like you said, you couldn't make those movies today. Oh, they wouldn't get made. And and no. you know, so, some life, like so, say for instance, because I know I'm I'm younger and obviously, um, but it's like I a lot of my friends I try and sort of show them or tell them or talk to them. A lot of them go, ah, it's, when was it made? Uh, well, yeah, seventy-four. Oh, I don't want to watch it. Well, why not? It's a story. They they just they just want to watch crap, you know. And it's like uh, they don't want that's, to watch. That's you know, sad because yeah, they're they're missing out. They're they're you know, missing it, out big time. It's the same thing like we were saying, you know, when people what you were saying earlier was when someone goes on like that that girl that went onto the set and I want to see DiCaprio. I want to see how much money do you get paid? And it, it's like but that's not the point, you, you know. It's they, but that shows you, you know, they just don't care. They just, just they don't care. You know, they just want to, yeah. you know. 
and it's um it's sad because then i can't i can't i can i can actually i remember one i was it was a, i did a commercial um that i was in uh for poly a poly cell like that it's like for cracks on the wall and i was the main person in the commercial i'll send it to you and uh the special effects guy that did the there was the talking ass in it a talking bum <laughs> and, and and it said uh fill those cracks up on the wall and uh <laughs> I'll send it to you because it was hilarious. Okay, yeah. like and um, <laughs> they they wound up. They it didn't they didn't air it, but it went viral. It went online, but it, they did. Oh, that's funny. And um, I remember the the guy did the, the effects. Uh, Dan Martin, his name is, and he um, the whole day, the whole day, the whole day we were doing the advert. It was just me and him talking about movies, but no one else knew what we were talking about. Right. We were, we were we we were like we we were chatting, but no one else. Had no idea what we were talking about, <laughs> so it was it was great, and we we, we uh, you know like the director didn't know anything we were talking about, and it's like uh, it's like how not to sound above, but we knew more than any of them, so it was like uh, it, oh, it just it was great, it was great because he he you know he he done lots of makeup and effects, he was a makeup and effects artist, and he worked on he did like Shim, I think he he worked on um, Shimon Centipede, he did some. To make up on that, and he, um, uh-huh. he, uh, he, he. I remember one time recently. Actually, he asked me if I could uh, do some live castings for for heads that he had to cut up. He had to mold a head, and I yeah. didn't get it. But he, um, he did. He did contact me. So, uh, but yeah, no, that was interesting because it was it was nice when you when you um, sort of make you know you meet people and then you get to. Uh, you know, work with them, then you have a, you just, you just really, uh, it flows, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's I was, like you say, you, put, you probably had that with loads of actors and most other, other members of the makeup crew and, and uh, yeah, it was just great, we got on so well, I had a great time, I mean, uh, I remember the uh, director and producer didn't get on though, they were arguing because they were like, um, they didn't know what they were doing or they couldn't decide what they were doing and then they had uh, the company there that we were advertising for, and it was just all like uh, it was like my first big commercial thing I did. So that was um, it took ages to get paid though. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, it, d- d- yeah, yeah. That it, kind of stuff it, it does. Yeah. It took like months. I mean, yeah. They, they held it on. Yeah, those, for so those, long. Are, those are the types that you yeah. get worried about. You're like, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It took ages. Yeah. I was like. Because we haven't got um, over here, it's not a Screen Actors Guild, so we don't get residuals. We just get right payout one yeah. like payout fee for it. So you know, it was um, it was yeah, nice. It, to, it, you know, Italy, Italy's that way as well. Yeah, it, it's the Europe, isn't it? I suppose Europe's like the same. You know, um, yeah. you, you don't get if you're on a screen. That's why America's good in a way because at least you get the Screen Actors Guild. You get residuals, so you can you can actually earn oh. a living, right? So yeah, but, but over here it's harder because you can't really you have to have another job or you have to have some other form of income or you have to um either go to america <laughs> which is uh i think not that but then they come over here a lot so you know it's uh or you get lucky and you just keep working and that's you know you just have to yep. keep gee, i think you just have to keep creative all the time and just uh just keep going that's all you can do you know but that yep. that was uh that was good fun, and I, I did this um, did this uh, series as well, which is on Amazon, uh, where I have a it's like a little horror anthology series. But what's I that like, called? Uh, dark ditties. And, uh, dark what? I, uh, ditties. I'll send you the link. I'll send yeah. you. I'll send you the link. But I had like yeah, a little, let's see that. Yeah. I had like a little cameo. It's like a cool. little cameo in that, but it was it was uh, nothing big, just a little little part but then i um fun you know it was fu- yeah it was quite fun it was hard but fun because <laughs> i remember it was freezing i was in my pants and i played this thing called the gimp and it was cold and <laughs> freezing and it was uh yeah lots of blood and makeup and there was a guy as a makeup guy actually uh his name's stuart conran and uh he he worked with peter jackson on brain dead and he um he did uh I think he worked on Batman, Tim Burton's Batman. He he worked on Hellraiser, one and two, and he um he was only six. He's, he, he's, he's, he's got to know a friend of mine, man. 
um, that I work with, uh, Nick Nick Dudman. He probably does because he was yeah, because he did Batman. Nick, because Nick did uh, what Michael Keaton, uh, Nichol Nicholson as the oh. Joker. Ah, oh, yeah. So he probably does. Yeah, he probably does. I mean, I know Nick, that um, Nick Nick does all the Nick does all the Harry Potter films and stuff now. Nick's a really good guy. Nick Nick Dudman, really good guy. And he's from the UK as well. He's yeah. English. Yeah, I I because yeah. I, I, I watched the documentary about him doing the makeup on Nicholson. Yeah, uh, it was called From Jack to the from Joe from Joe from Jack to the Joker. So that was uh, a good. Uh, he he couldn't. I think uh, when he did Jack Nicholson, they had to use. Um, I think he had an aller allergic reaction to the makeup, so they had to use a different makeup for the Joker. Um, so that was a long process of doing Nicholson. And uh, yep. But yeah, no, I I do like those. Um, Burton films. I think uh, I do like the. Uh, I do like. I mean, I think Michael Keaton was my favorite Batman. I agree. Yeah, I, agree. I, 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 I've got, I've got them on my wall actually. Um, oh yeah, I see that. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, I thought, <laughs> I, I, I thought, um, yeah, I thought that Keaton was the best, uh, best Batman, and probably because he, he was I against agree. type. He, he just, just. Uh, it wasn't some muscle bound actor. It was a regular person, but he was a psycho, which is. Yep. And he was, uh, yeah, it was, I just think it was, it was a really good choice, a really brave, bold, um, casting, you know, I a lot totally of people, didn't like, you know, it was, uh, and I remember he did, um, he'd been Beetlejuice and he did clean and sober, which is a good, uh, yeah. Which is like, you know, he did, so he did Beetlejuice, clean and sober, and then he'd done some whole con, uh, comic performances but then he but when he played Batman no one thought he could do it and then he proved them wrong so uh, against no, Ty it's fantastic and I really like Batman Returns as well because it's even darker it's uh, they, he went crazy with it because uh, he'd been so successful with the first one so he uh, he yep. decided to go even more crazier totally, totally agree um, something that you might if you don't know something you might want to check out going back to Blue Velvet for a sec, um, Criterion, you know, uh, released, yeah. yeah, they recently, you know, released Blue Velvet and it has Deleted. a lot more, a lot more um, special features on the disc, um, including a documentary, which I'm actually in as well. Is that Mysteries of Love? Now, Mysteries of Love is the old one. It's That's been the old one. This is a new ever. one. Yeah. Um, there is, um, um, uh, there's two new documentaries on, which I'm in both, but I'm mean, actually interviewed in, in uh, what's it called? Um, I can't remember what it's called now. But they're both, they're both on the, the Criterion. It's, it's worth trying to find the Criterion, the new release of that, just for some of the special features that are only available. I'm gonna get that. Yeah, I can track that down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, there, there was a there was a the thing that is so much fun for me to watch now. And I'm so glad that it's on there. Was there was a young German guy that wrote to David um, prior to us doing Blue Velvet that was interested in the whole process and wanted to come over and shoot uh, a documentary. So David invited him to come while we did Blue Velvet. And this guy came and shot Super 8, <laughs> um, a documentary which is now on this, this uh, Criterion thing. Uh, this and it, it's fabulous to watch because, I mean, he's shooting us making the movie. That's So, so it's like you're, you're there and you, you, you can see how it was yeah. basically shot basically yeah moment it's, to moment. It's, it's amazing now after all these years to go back and see that it's basically like a time capsule i mean it's yeah. um it's it's it must be so strange because it was no it was pre-digital so you're now yeah being able to see it is from the fact that it was over 30 what over 30 years ago it must be uh 34 34 30 we, we shot it in 80 uh we shot it in '85. It came out in '86. So that's 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 thirty seven, almost thirty seven years now. Jesus, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> it's that, that that's how quick time goes, you know. And then like, uh, but then that's how strong a life the film has. Yeah. So you know, like uh, all these films, like Blade Runner, the thing, John Carpenter, the thing. And, Love it. Love um, it. The Mad Max, the Road Warrior, all these kind of yep. films. Love them. They have such a long life, like Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from New York. And, Love it. Um, yeah. These these films have a long, they just have such a long life. I mean, look, that, that's uh, uh, the thing. And Escape oh, yeah. And, yeah. I love that. Yep. Total Recall, the original. Oh, yeah. The original Total right. Recall. Yeah. I was supposed to do that one too. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that would have been an interesting one because they did that in Mexico, didn't they? I think. Yeah, that was a. I, I, uh, did, did, uh, Dino was supposed to. They. they Dino uh, was well, on that. I, uh, yeah. That was a. It, Total Recall actually was a joke for so many of us for years because originally Dino was supposed to do that. That script kept floating around uh, with us for years. And we, we actually started dubbing it uh, Arnold Saves Mars. <laughs> um because it was always set to be arnold uh with the, the early dino stuff and um uh i was doing a movie um that was directed by volker slorndorf who i loved volker slorndorf directed the tin drum great german director um we were doing the handmaid's tale the movie version in 1989 way before the TV series, of course, ever came about, which I think the TV series is good, but we did, people aren't even aware that we did a movie version of this film in 1989, um, The Handmaid's Tale. But anyway, I was doing The Handmaid's Tale, um, and the producer came to me and said, um, because they wanted me to do Total Recall, because it was the same producers that I had done Rambo with, Oh yeah, because oh, because that's right because that was, it was Mar Mario Gazar, Buzz Feige, that whole the whole group. Yeah, so they wanted me to do um, Total Recall, and I was like I said doing The Handmaid's Tale, and it was overlapping, and so I said no. Producer from The Handmaid's Tale, who who's a good friend of mine, who I've done a lot of stuff with now over the years, came to me and says he says I've never experienced anything like this. I say, what? He goes, they want you so bad that the producers called me up and said that you said you weren't going to do their film because it overlaps with this. So they're willing to pay to have another makeup artist come in and they'll pay for the other makeup artist to come in and pay the other makeup sa artist salary if you will agree to leave to go do Total Recall. And I still said no, because I thought, no, I, I got too many good big actors, one of them being Robert Duvall on The Handmaid's Tale. I said, I, I don't feel comfortable walking away from, this. from, this these, is. from these people. So I, di I didn't do it. <laughs> so yeah, then, but, you got, then, there's, uh, but you had other stuff that was just as good, you know I mean? Even though that might have been an interesting one to work on, but there's always yeah, no, I, yeah, everything's, everything's for a reason. Everything's for a reason, yeah. 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 Even even if you, you know, you sort of stun stuff that you wish you could uh, could do, but then there's you worked on a whole bunch of other stuff that someone probably thought they the same as well. So it's uh, yeah, it's uh, always opportunities we that you we, miss. We, we we can't do them all. Yeah, <laughs> you got. I mean, you got to work and you got you got to live. So you know, yeah, there's you got to just keep going so we can live. So it's yep. yeah, but yeah, no, it's uh. It's been great chatting, anyway. So um, you too, man. Yeah, too. We'll, we'll um, I'll post this up and um, okay, you can share it. And... Keep keep in touch with me on Facebook too. Now we know. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah no, I've um, yeah. And if you uh, you know, if you want to ever message me or um, anything, you know, you're welcome to, and right. you know, and just stay in touch, you know. And, you do you do you the know. same. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah and I'll keep All posting right. the um, that I'll post the uh, some more uh lynch and blue velvet stuff up so cool. yeah all right yeah. man yeah Appreciate take care it. yeah all right have a good Stop night best. yeah you too take care